Chapter 52 Detroit Rock City, back where it all began, Tiger Stadium sold out June 28, 1996. Gene, Ace, Peter, and me together again. Magic. Electricity. Here we are. We had arrived ten days earlier, once again leaving nothing to chance, and had done seven rehearsals, including one full dress rehearsal. Ace was late for all of them. At this point in my life, there were certain perks and prerequisites I felt I had earned and were necessary to make the coming tour manageable. We booked the best hotels. I wasn't going to be staying in hotels with a paper ring around the toilet seat saying, Sanitize for your protection. Ace and Peter hadn't stayed in the upper echelon hotels in the 16 years since they'd last toured with Kiss. Peter, in particular, seemed completely lacking in world experience. I took him to Starbucks one day, and he was blown away by how good a biscotti he was. Quite quickly, both Peter and Ace came to resent the fact that they weren't as worldly or savvy when it came to maneuvering in nice surroundings. Peter constantly felt disrespected by hotel staff, for instance, which was simply the result of his feeling intimidated by them, and almost anyone else, for that matter. On the afternoon of the show, we did a sound check. As I stood on the stage, it was still hard to grasp that this baseball stadium would be jammed to capacity in a few hours. We took pictures, enjoying the moment. Peter, who had recently broken up with a girlfriend and was there on his own, seemed uncharacteristically open and grateful. His tendency was always to become dependent on someone and cut himself off from everybody else by using his girlfriend as a buffer, either a good buffer or a bad buffer, depending on the woman's personality. Now single, Peter let himself bask in the moment. That night, on our way to the stage, golf carts drove us through the maze-like bowels of the stadium. Suddenly, we emerged from one of the access ramps to the area behind the stage, and the air was electric. You could hear the excitement, the anticipation. It was overwhelming. I realized I was suddenly exponentially more important than I had been just a few months before, because I was again a member not just of KISS, but of this version of KISS. I could hear the pent-up feelings of the people waiting for the show. People had made the journey from around the world to witness this night. It was deafening. When the lights went down, it was pandemonium. It seemed like 40,000 flashbulbs went off as people waited for us to emerge. I knew this show was pivotal. This show would reintroduce the band and the imagery and everything that went with it. This show could allow us to move forward, to continue. It felt like we were in the eye of a hurricane, everything swirling around us as we calmly watched from the quiet of backstage. As we took the stage, still behind the curtain, I felt an incredible wave of pressure. The sound of the crowd had a tangible force to it, and even as the place went quiet, the noise of 40,000 people breathing created a deafening kind of hush. I had never felt like this before. All right, Detroit, you wanted the best, you got the best. The hottest band in the world? Kiss! The curtain dropped and the force of the crowd reaction nearly lifted me off my feet. I had to fight to be in control of the situation, of myself, of my persona, of the band. I was worried about staying connected to Peter. There was going to be a lot of foot tapping and hand signals I knew in order to keep him with us. Fortunately, he was happy to have the guidance. It wasn't like him, to be honest, to be open to that sort of thing, but for the time being, Peter was terrific, working hard, being cheerful and appreciative. The joy for me was being able to revisit something I'd experienced as a much younger person in a different frame of mind. When I was in the midst of it the first time around, I had the sense it would never end. No matter how thankful I was, I had still suspected it would be endless. Then it had died down. But there on that stage, with Kiss reunited, facing that kind of energy again, I felt thankful in an entirely different way. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about fame. I had those things already. This was the chance to read a book that I'd read as a kid, to see a movie that I'd seen when I was younger, to get something out of the experience that I hadn't had the capacity to get or appreciate before. I was overwhelmed by a sense of gratitude. As the tour continued, everyone seemed to share that feeling, at least initially. Peter swore up and down that he wouldn't repeat the mistakes he had made the first time around. And for the first few months of the reunion tour, we voted Peter the MVP. 
He often joined us for dinner. He was upbeat and pleasant to be around. His attitude seemed to mirror mine. We were incredibly fortunate to have this opportunity. One of the things we had worried about on the reunion was Peter's drum solo. He had wanted to play one from the get-go. In a perfect world, a solo was part of what we did. We had always had a drum solo during the Alive years. Looking back, it wasn't clear why we felt we needed to, but it had become a tradition. In the meantime, Peter's abilities had greatly deteriorated. But since he wanted to do it, and it was part of the tradition, Gene agreed to help him put one together. Fortunately, by the 90s, you could hit a Coke bottle with a stick and make it sound explosive and powerful if you put enough effects on it. And that's exactly what we did. We put triggers on each individual drum so when Peter hit one, it activated a pre-recorded drum sound. Although Peter had played with fire in the 70s, he was a shadow of himself now. On the reunion tour, he hit the drums like he was worried his arms would snap if he did anything more than barely tap them. His arms hurt, he said. How hard you hit the drums determined the activation of the triggers, but fortunately, they could be set to any level of sensitivity. We used to say we had the trigger set so Peter could play a solo by sneezing. I'd hear these huge drum sounds and turn around to look at Peter and see that he was barely moving his sticks. But we wanted to succeed, and succeed we did, for a time. Then came Gigi. She was a born-again Christian who by all accounts had been a dancer before, and I don't mean she was in Swan Lake. When Peter got together with her, things started to change quickly. Peter reminded me of a small animal. When it's afraid, it's timid, but when it feels protected, it shows its teeth. Peter latched onto her and started to distance himself from everyone else. I was amazed that while he and Gigi professed a deep love of God and religion, they inflicted nothing but pain and suffering on all those around them. Suddenly, when I called his room to talk, she would answer and say, What do you want? Is Peter there? What do you need him for? Just get him on the damn phone. You're a guest. She became a gatekeeper. The tour might as well have been printing money by this time. Everything was selling out and we kept adding shows. We were living an amazing life, flying around in a large private jet with a flight attendant, staying at beautiful hotels. We were on top of the world. Peter and Ace made millions of dollars, and they hadn't made squat in the nearly two decades they'd been out of the band. They had nothing before the reunion, and yet, as soon as their bank accounts began to fill up again, they changed. Peter's hotel requests necessitated Doc printing a multi-page handbook that was distributed to hotel staff wherever we went. It contained a set of complicated rules. If Peter put a sign on his door with one symbol, the staff could go in and vacuum, but they couldn't touch the windows. Another sign meant they could air the room out, but not touch the towels. He needed to be a certain distance from the elevators. He couldn't be too high up. He made them cover certain windows with tin foil. Are you kidding me? This time last year, you'd never been to a Starbucks. One afternoon, I heard screams and crashing sounds coming from the hall. I opened my hotel room door and saw Doc running past toward Peter and Gigi's room. Dishes were flying out of the room and smashing against the opposite wall in the hallway. What's wrong? What's wrong? Doc shouted. They didn't clean my room, screamed Peter. But Peter, you put your sign on the door. That means they can't come in. The cracks in the band were beginning to show already. Some nights, Ace nodded out while putting his makeup on, just slumped into his chair with a paintbrush practically stuck in his eye. His use of a variety of illegal drugs was again out of control. He would go through all kinds of contortions. He even managed to get a superficial gun wound in Dallas and then demand prescriptions for more drugs. Doc would have to blow the whistle and tell doctors not to give him painkillers. As Doc used to say, Ace has the willpower of a grub worm. It was sad and frustrating. This should have been four guys celebrating something miraculous. Instead, it became hard work just to make sure it came off every day, that Peter and Ace got out of their rooms, that we made it to the venue, that we got through a show. While I traveled with one rolling suitcase, Ace was now traveling with 17 bags, including one that weighed more than 100 pounds. In it was a projector and cable so he could run an image of his face and Elvis's face morphing into each other on a loop in his hotel room. 
Ace brought along some interesting girlfriends, too. One liked to wander out into the audience with a clipboard and take notes. Apparently, she was checking to make sure Ace was mixed loudly enough. Another one must have shot up on the plane because she left blood all over her seat. She was in such bad shape, we sent a doctor into Ace's dressing room to have a look at her. If I were you, the doctor told us, I wouldn't have her traveling with you because she's going to die. Doc handled that situation, and she was never seen on the tour again. Needless to say, Doc was increasingly pissed off at Peter and Ace. You're going to be changed out, he told them. This is a business. I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not here to preserve the past. I'm here to make this thing move forward and grow. If you're a hindrance, you're going to go. It would be a shame for you to miss this opportunity. You have a second lease on life. Why can't you just ride the pony? They hated Doc for saying that, but he was sick of having to drag them through everything and motivate them to do the basic things they needed to do for us to function as a band. As things went south, though, a lot of the fallout actually landed on Tommy Thayer, who had to take over as tour manager of the operation about six months into the first year of the reunion tour. Tommy spent 90% of his time and energy dealing with things a person shouldn't have to deal with, making new arrangements when Peter or Ace missed a flight or didn't show up for a car pickup, making sure the hotel staff didn't take the tinfoil off Peter's windows, whatever it was. Ace was chronically late getting out of his hotel room when we needed to get to a venue or to our jet. For a while, Tommy just lied to him about departure times, pushing them an hour forward so there was a chance of Ace's making the actual time. But when Ace realized that, he got bent out of shape. At some stage, Tommy came to me with the realization I had been waiting for. He admitted that the perception he'd had of me and Gene as the tight asses, the business guys, and Ace and Peter as the rock and roll guys couldn't have been more wrong. Being inept, unreliable, and marginally capable didn't make you rock and roll. It made you inept, unreliable, and marginally capable. Ace was now, in Tommy's words, a fucking loser. In early 1997, we flew to Japan where we were received like heroes once again, huge crowds awaiting us everywhere we appeared. We traveled between shows by bullet train, One afternoon, we went to board a train, and an enormous crowd greeted us once again. Kids gathered at the station to see us. We walked through the station surrounded by security people, and when we arrived on the platform, it too was mobbed with fans. It was incredible, again. I felt blown away. We should wake up every day and thank whatever God we believe in for what we are experiencing. And at that moment, Peter turned to me and said, I'm sick and tired of this hard day's night shit. I was speechless. Chapter 53 In April 1997, before a show in Georgia, Peter started grousing that his hands hurt. I can't do the show, he said, calling Doc from his hotel room. Fine, said Doc. He then called Peter's roadie, Eddie Cannon. Shave your beard, Doc said. You're on tonight. Peter heard about it and went ape shit. The fans will never accept it, he screamed. You can't put someone else out there in my makeup. I disagree, said Doc dryly. Yeah, well, actually, Peter, we have a show to do. Eddie shaved and put on Peter's makeup. One, two, three, four, let's go. We launched into the show. I introduced Eddie from the stage and, surprise, surprise, either nobody cared or nobody had time to care. This was the night and this would be the show. We weren't going to put on a show because Peter's hands hurt? I don't think so, pal, because the show, as they say, must go on. Ace started getting paranoid. He had rented an apartment off La Cienica Boulevard in L.A. and spent off days there. But he was convinced the place was bugged, that he was being watched. So he pulled all the electrical wires and phone lines out of the place. The owners went crazy. Ace also started studying our tour books, which contained the tour itinerary, site specifications, all sorts of pertinent info. He would bring the tour book to the dressing room and say, how many people paid last night? Let's say the answer that night was 18,700. Bullshit, he would scream. It says right here, 24,100. Ace, I'd try to explain, that's the venue capacity, not the number of tickets sold and it's not the capacity for a concert. Bullshit. Part of Ace's contract included a stipulation that he not get high. 
but he carried around a shoulder bag that might as well have been made of gold for the way Ace clung to it. He had pills tucked into the sleeves of his onstage outfit. The problem was, how could we enforce the contract? Stop the tour? Fine him? During the tour, Peter and Ace's representative, George, demanded a meeting with the entire band to go over finances. His intention clearly was to show us and his clients that he was a force to be reckoned with. He came in wearing a blazer and tie in an effort to look businesslike with Ace and Peter trailing behind him. He set up an easel and started pointing at numbers. His grasp of the business was not much better than Ace's. After months of nonsensical requests and suggestions of poor budgeting, we finally had enough. We took him apart, item by item. He was completely ill-equipped regarding finances or touring, and Ace and Peter were silenced when they saw it. At the end of the tour in July 1997, Peter and Ace demanded to be made full members of the band again. We did things your way, Peter said, and we had a huge successful tour. Now we want to be equals. Being stunned by one of these guys was an almost daily occurrence, but this dropped my jaw. Don't you realize the reason it was a big success is because you had no input and no say? We'd made a lot of money and we'd made a lot of people happy. Peter and Ace were upset because they were now rich again, but not as rich as me and Jean. There were people richer than I was, and I didn't lose sleep over it. And anyway, I deserved more than Peter and Ace did. I stayed when they left. The door swings one way. I nurtured the band and kept it going. For that alone, I deserved to be better compensated. In a million years, I would never have brought them in as equal members. Not a chance. Peter and Ace were also totally unequipped to be involved in the decision-making process. They had no idea how the concert business and music business were run, and yet they seemed to think they had now earned the right to participate in decision-making in a world they knew nothing about. It was sad to see. On the one hand, they sometimes acknowledged they had made bad decisions in life, but on the other hand, they ultimately found solace in believing that they had been taken advantage of that they were victims, then and now. When they'd struck out on their own after leaving KISS, they'd had tremendous advantages, name recognition, notoriety, industry contacts, money, but they could barely get arrested before the reunion tour, and they were broke. They'd been thankful at the start of the tour because they had found a way out of the miserable, marginal lives they were living. Now, just a year later, they were millionaires, but they were bitter. They were defensive. They were unrealistic about their own importance and abilities. They were, in their minds, victims. It was insane. Ace kept grumbling that if he had retained the name Kiss, the band would have been successful without me and Gene. He had another brilliant argument, too. I'm actually responsible for the whole reunion, Ace said. Okay. If I had never quit, there wouldn't be a reunion. Wow. Everybody should be thanking me, Ace continued. This tour only happened because I quit. I didn't know how to respond to that kind of logic. Doc suggested we just get rid of Peter and Ace. He always believed we could do it without them. He saw no upside to continuing with them. If you're a good person, there's very little I can do to make you a bad person, Doc said. But if you're an asshole, there's very little I can do to make you a good person. That was his way of saying there was no way around the dysfunctionality if we continued to work with Ace and Peter. We had another idea. We would make a reunion record. I didn't want to be plagued by thoughts of things I could have done. I didn't want to have regrets about not giving this a real try. When we had put the band together in its original form, I for one had hoped that could lead us to some spectacular places— I hoped seeing what we had all learned and bringing all of our experiences to the table would be a winning formula. If nothing else, working together again would alleviate any lingering questions of culpability and show whether there were any mistakes that could be rectified. I was pretty sure I had the answers to those questions after the reunion tour. People don't change, and we separate from them for a core reason. But I didn't want to be wrong. I didn't want to miss out on the chance to take it all the way. To produce Psycho Circus, we brought in Bruce Fairburn, who had been involved with some very big records from Bon Jovi, Aerosmith, and Loverboy, among others. He turned out to be ill-suited for the job. 
On his big records of the 1980s, he had worked with a team that included Bob Rock and Mike Fraser, both of whom went on to do tremendous things. Sometimes when a team splits and various members try things on their own, you get a better sense of who did what by who succeeds and who doesn't. Bruce chose awful songs from the demos to record for the album. The song that eventually made the most noise turned out to be the title track, Psycho Circus. Bruce wanted to leave it off the album. He was so far up Gene's ass he not only couldn't see, he couldn't hear. One day I finally had to say to Bruce, this is your first Kiss album. This is my 18th. You will leave here and go on to something else. I won't. I have to stand by this record, so I'm going to do what I want. I went into the studio that weekend and recorded Psycho Circus. Making the album was a disaster all around. Peter and Ace didn't show up. I don't think Bruce would have used Peter anyway since he couldn't play much beyond the dog tricks Tommy had taught him to get through the reunion set list. Instead of working with Ace and Peter, we spent all our time talking to their attorneys. I wish their attorneys could have played on the album. It would have been cheaper. Chapter 54 I realized one day near the end of the tour that I had to use one hand to support the other arm when I reached up to grab something from a shelf. By the end of the tour, I couldn't raise my arm, when I got home, I went to see a doctor who said I needed an operation to repair a badly torn rotator cuff. I told Pam I had to have surgery. When the day of the surgery arrived, she told me she had an audition the next day. She had already shipped Evan off to her parents' place in Texas for a few weeks. I don't want to compromise the audition, she said, so I'm going to stay in a hotel tonight and work on my scene. Pam drove me home from the hospital and then left. The doctor who performed the surgery sent me home with a prescription for Vicodin and a cooling system that pumped ice water over my shoulder from a bucket. I took my painkillers and refilled my bucket of ice water by myself throughout the knife in a dark and empty house. I can't believe I'm alone. I can't believe she did this. Pam wanted to believe she had given up her career for me or for Evan when the truth was that her career had given her up. She just wasn't getting work. I guess it was easier to blame me. Of course I was to blame, but for different reasons. I had been intent on settling down, and even though Pam was a good person, she wasn't the right person for me to do that with. I was bullheaded about making it happen and making it work in spite of things I saw from the very beginning that were contrary to what I wanted. Before I was married, I could go to Europe whenever I wanted, she said one day. Yeah, I said. Ten years ago, I was banging women whose names I didn't know. Great, but that's not now. Clearly, neither of us was happy. Pam had become friends with an actress whose career suddenly surged when she was in her 40s. She came to be seen as a symbol. Her success represented a victory for middle-aged women against the stereotyping that many of them faced. I didn't think she was particularly warm or particularly bright. Her husband, who struck me as a spoiled rich kid, didn't make me feel any warmer about the couple. The actress had been invited onto Oprah Winfrey's TV show as part of an ongoing segment on how various women managed to balance their independence with success and home life. In the run-up to her appearance, she said to me, I don't know what to say, and asked me to help. So I wrote some pap for her that read like a bad episode of Kung Fu. If you think of yourself as a tree... Your family are your roots, and the deeper your roots go, the more fruit the branches can bear. She actually used what I had written on TV. Oprah and the audience lapped it up. Wouldn't it be hysterical if all the people watching realized that this liberated, intellectual woman had been spoon-fed her lines by that male chauvinist bozo from Kiss? At one point, Vanna White, another friend of Pam's, recommended that we go see the marriage counselor she and her husband were seeing. He looked like Curly from the Three Stooges and wore Star Wars ties and had Star Trek memorabilia around his office. Here we were sitting with Captain Curly on the Starship Enterprise, and I was thinking it was all nuts. Vanna and her husband, incidentally, split up. Pam and I went to another therapist during our first trial separation. She had us do exercises together, like pretending we had just started to date each other, or making gifts or drawing pictures for each other. 
Great. When are we making potholders? Counseling with her went on for quite some time, but it struck me as a waste of time. The counselor may have meant well, but she should have been more direct. We didn't deal with the core issues, the fact that we were on fundamentally different pages. If we had acknowledged that, perhaps we could have split up neatly. Maybe part of marriage counseling should be helping people to divorce well rather than having them make doodles for each other. During the separation, Gene generously offered me his guest house. I appreciated the offer and gladly accepted. When I first showed up, his kids, Nick and Sophie, greeted and welcomed me. It was a lovely gesture. My room felt like a college dorm, and it was the perfect place to reflect on my life. A few months later, when the therapist suggested that Pam and I move back in together, I couldn't see why and resisted. Nothing had changed. Nothing had been resolved. What was the point? Reluctantly, I agreed to move from the frying pan into the fire. When Psycho Circus was ready for release, Doc booked us a Halloween show at Dodger Stadium on October 31, 1998, to kick off a tour to support the album. We put on a real spectacle with circus sideshow acts on the huge stage. The Smashing Pumpkins opened the show and, in the spirit of Halloween, dressed like the Beatles circa 1964. As I got ready to walk to the stage, Pam let me know she was pissed off that I was distracted and not paying enough attention to her. I said my best bewildered apologies and headed out. It was another night of glorious pandemonium as the curtain dropped and the bombs went off. We had booked rooms at the Sunset Marquee in Hollywood so we could all get ready together as a band and have a place to clean up afterwards. At the end of the show, we all hopped straight in a van in full makeup and costumes to return to the hotel. As we got near the Sunset Marquee, the streets became clogged. Soon, the van couldn't move at all. Thousands of people were out in the streets. Somehow, we'd forgotten the Hollywood Halloween Parade. We were about seven blocks from the hotel when it dawned on me that we could get out and walk. Come on, let's go, I said. What? We're in full gear. It's Halloween. Everyone's dressed up. It'll be okay. We had no choice anyway. We climbed out of the van and started walking down the crowded street along with the costumed crowds. Soon, though, a few people stopped and stared at us. Wow, man, great costumes. You really look like them. Thanks a lot, I said. We kept walking. Other people gave us thumbs up. Cool costumes, guys. Nobody had a clue we were the real kiss walking back from playing to 40,000 people. As the Psycho Circus tour went on, it was clear to Doc, Gene, and me that we couldn't continue. Ace wanted out to work on his fabled solo album, the one he'd been working on since the 1980s. Peter had Gigi running interference for him and whispering in his ear. The only way to keep the tour going was to talk about ending things. At some point, I pulled Peter aside and told him, You're doing it again. You're doing what you said you would never do again. You're not the same happy guy who came to the reunion saying he had blown it the last time around. You're doing the same thing all over again. Musically, we were regressing. At times, Ace played songs in the wrong key without even realizing it. Throughout the various reunion tours, I had insisted on building in off days to allow me to get home for visits with little Evan. He remained my priority. I thought the initial bonding time was critical. Once in a while, Pam also traveled to meet me on the road. She was going to join me in Florida in January 1999, and I wanted to surprise her with a gift for her upcoming birthday. I'd gotten her a Jaguar sedan a few years before, and the lease was coming to an end. She had always loved the two-seater Mercedes SL Coupe, so I decided to buy her one for her birthday. I made some calls and arranged the whole thing. When she arrived on tour, I told her, I wanted to do something special for your birthday, but I didn't want you to have to wait until then. You won't get it until you're back home, but I wanted you to know, I got you a white Mercedes 320 SL. Then I handed her the color brochure I'd been carrying around in anticipation of this moment. A 320, she said. I don't want some small Mercedes. Oh, no. I wanted validation. Instead, I had to explain to her all the details about the car, how the 320 SL was the same body and interior as a 550 SL, but that it had a six-cylinder engine instead of a V8, which made no difference for the way she used her car around town. But as I began to explain all this, I suddenly changed my mind. I could explain. I could apologize. I could change the order. 
but it didn't matter. It was ruined. Forget it, I said. Happy birthday. On the way home from another tour leg where Pam joined me, she told me she had lost her engagement ring. I couldn't believe she could lose a five-carat diamond, but she started sobbing. Don't worry, I told her. I'll just get a new one. The day I picked up the new ring from the jewelers, I spotted Pam and her parents driving down Beverly Boulevard. I flagged them down. I couldn't wait. I got out of my car and went over to hers to show her the ring. She looked at it and said, Oh, the setting isn't what I expected. I felt deflated. Don't I ever get the cookie? Don't I ever get the pat on the head? There was a lot of sexual temptation on tour, amplified by the way things were going with Pam. When it came to sex, I was an alcoholic and touring was an open bar. But if my marriage wasn't going to work out, I wanted to be clear on why it didn't work out. What was true of the band and the reason I wanted to try to make an album with the original four guys was true of my marriage. If I was going to walk away from something, the most important thing was to know I did everything I could to try to make it work. I didn't want any lingering what-ifs. I didn't want my marriage to end and wonder where the part of the reason was because I had cheated. So I didn't. I would have hated myself. It would have confirmed my worst feelings about myself. It was depressingly familiar territory. Dysfunction in the band, dysfunction at home. Feeling lonely and hating each day for the mess I had created. Chapter 55 at the end of 1998, I got a call from my agent at CAA, the talent agency that represented us. Are you interested in theater, he asked me. Maybe, I said. Well, you would have to audition. What for? Phantom of the Opera. Wow, Phantom? Absolutely. Where and when? I realized immediately this was a case of stunt casting, that is bringing in somebody from a realm other than Broadway or the legitimate theater world in order to spur ticket sales. My fame got me the audition, but I wasn't insulted. This was Phantom, the masked musician whose hideous deformed face was revealed. The show that had taken my breath away in London ten years before. Phantom. Even so, I wouldn't have agreed to audition if there had been conflicting plans for the band. But we would have a big block of free time once the Psycho Circus tour ended, and it would be a long time before I would think about making another album. A very long time, indeed. The audition was for the Toronto production, which was then in its tenth year. If I made the cut, I would take over the role in May 1999. The Psycho Circus tour ran through the end of April, and then we were pretty much off until 2000 when we would go back out for a farewell tour that was already in the works. Who knew what would happen after the farewell tour? Musical theater was an avenue I now wanted to explore, I might need a second act soon enough. KISS had the month of January 1999 off before playing the Super Bowl pregame show on January 31st. The audition was scheduled to take place in New York since all principals in the show had to audition and be signed off on by Hal Prince and his staff who did the casting worldwide. Rockstar or not, they weren't going to jeopardize a billion-dollar franchise. I spent weeks practicing the three songs that were required for the audition. Playing the Phantom meant so much to me that I also wanted to try to control the audition situation as much as possible to give myself the best shot. I realized the singing would be only one of the determining factors in getting the part. When I finally went to the audition, I walked in and made small talk with the staff. I flirted a little with the woman who was there to sing the role of Christine with me. People were sitting at desks like judges at the Olympics, as if they were waiting to hold up numbers after I sang. I spoke to them, made some jokes, and knowing I would only get one chance, waited until I felt comfortable and ready. Don't blow this. When I finished a full audition of songs and scene blocking, I knew I had nailed it. Sure enough, my agent called me soon after to tell me I'd been offered the role. To make it official, I did a press conference after the Psycho Circus tour resumed. As I talked with reporters on the conference call, the same thoughts kept going through my head. I'm fucked. I can't get out of this now. It would be a trial by fire because there was very little time between the end of the Kiss tour and my Phantom debut. I had muscled my voice through the audition, but could I really do it night after night? I had to learn the entire show while on tour. 
I memorized the melodies and lyrics during downtime and off days, and I tested myself during KISS shows. I sang songs on the side of the stage whenever I had a break, like when the other band members had their solos. I figured that if I could still focus in the midst of complete bedlam and chaos, I really knew the material. KISS wrapped up the Psycho Circus tour in Mexico City. Right after the show, I cut my hair and headed up to Toronto. Rehearsals started immediately at a studio used by theaters and the local ballet company. When I walked in the first day, the only person there was the show's musical director. He seemed like a bit of a tight ass, and it was clear we were from different musical backgrounds. I was pretty sure he saw me as somebody without any pedigree coming in to desecrate the theater. The first thing he said was, Where's your script? I memorized it, I said. He looked at me like I was nuts. I told him, I may be a mutt in a kennel of purebreds here, but if you tell me what you want, I'll give it to you. He sat down at a piano and we started working, just the two of us. It was the hardest work I've ever done, six hours a day. I went home every night slumped in the back of a taxi, exhausted emotionally, and because of the demands of singing a different way and the physicality of the role in the staging, physically. I'd be damned if I was going to go in there and turn the show into the Rocky Horror Picture Show. This was a big, legit show with tremendous history, and I wasn't going to do a rock version of it. Almost immediately, I saw some problems navigating certain vocal passages. I had to figure out the breath control to make it through lines I hadn't written. I guess without thinking about it, when you write songs, you write what you can sing. Now I was singing lines that involved things beyond my experience things that weren't intuitive. With just a few weeks to go before I had to take the stage, I decided I should reach out and get help. I had never had much luck with vocal coaches before because they generally tried to completely change the way I sing. They used a cookie-cutter approach and gave rock singers stilted, pseudo-operatic voices disregarding what anyone had built naturally. You often hear those voices in bands that sing about slaying dragons and other mythological pap. After meeting another one of those typical coaches, I asked the musical director of the show for a recommendation. He suggested Jeffrey Heward, the previous musical director of Phantom. Jeffrey was very encouraging and supportive. They hired you because of the way you sing, he said. Your voice is terrific and we don't want to throw away the engine. We'll just fine-tune it. From that point on, during the morning hours before rehearsals, I worked with Jeffrey on my technique and comfort. He took me through exercises and scales and helped me with the phonetics and word pronunciation of musical theater. As I worked on scenes at rehearsals every day, I wore a t-shirt and jeans and a cape, and they handed me things to use as props. Here's a broomstick. It's an oar. Here's a cardboard box. Play it like it's an organ. If I could turn those things into the objects they were supposed to be, that reality would only be reinforced once I was on stage with the actual props in hand. The Pantages Theater, where the show was staged, was a beautifully renovated space with an orchestra pit and a marquee out front with my name on it. It was all about to happen. But days before opening, when we started to rehearse key scenes in the theater with the orchestra, I suddenly had problems because I couldn't hear on my right side. I hadn't realized my deafness would be so difficult to deal with. The orchestra was far enough away, and I was singing loud enough that it was very hard to hear the monitors and stay with the orchestra. But I found I caught on pretty fast after I looked like an idiot a few times. Toward the end of the theater rehearsals, a couple of women from the theater company came to watch. When I finished the final act, they were in tears. That's a good sign. Well, either that or I'm horrible. I'd been told the role of the Phantom was the loneliest role in the show because most of the time when the Phantom was on stage, the rest of the cast was off. When the Phantom was off stage, the rest of the cast was on. You rarely met anyone else. And then it was opening night, and I was waiting in the wings ready to do my first scene, standing behind a mirror. The only way out of this now is to do the show. When I leave, it's going to be after the curtain comes down. There was no editing, no second takes, no cutting to a different camera. This was it. I used the techniques and visualizations that Jeffrey had helped me with, and even though I wasn't as good as I would get as the show went on, I didn't fall on my face. As I settled in, I loved it. I loved giving something this level of concentration and trying to immerse myself in the character, 
despite a few devil horn salutes I saw in the audience that first night. Then came the moment in the production that had caused me to gasp the first time I saw it, when Christine rips off the Phantom's mask. I cringed as she took my mask off to reveal the horrid makeup beneath. I knew this scene. It was the scene I had feared my entire life, scrutinizing eyes staring at Stanley the one-eared monster, betrayed and exposed. But then Christine tells the Phantom his face holds no horror for her. It's in his soul that the true distortion lies. When she finally makes herself available to him, it is the Phantom who recoils and is unable to hold her. When I performed in Kiss, I was constantly interacting with the audience, bringing them to a certain level of excitement, leading them, cajoling them. Now I ignored the audience. People in the theater had to buy into what I was doing, and I couldn't get them to do so by winking at them. For me it came down to abandoning the audience and abandoning any sense of performance and just being that character and finding the truth in that moment. That was why the show that night and almost every night thereafter ended with me completely sweat-soaked and in tears. After that first night, the cast was great to me. I know they appreciated my dedication. Suddenly, I was captain of the team and everybody wound up hanging out in my dressing room. This may have been stunt casting, but as the show sold out, eight of them per week, I was helping to keep hundreds of people in work. My parents came to see the show early on, and I felt as if doing theater validated me in their eyes. No matter how ambivalent I felt about my parents, I realized in that moment that ultimately their approval was something I wanted. And when they saw me getting a standing ovation from a sold-out house, it felt terrific. Gene came to see me as well. It wasn't his cup of tea, but he seemed astonished. When he came to my dressing room after the show, he said, Where did you learn to sing like that? Peter came too. He showed a side of himself I rarely saw anymore. We went out for sushi after the show, and Peter was joyous and beaming, saying how proud he was of me. Every once in a while, he would show flashes of warmth, whether it was at the beginning of the band or at the beginning of the reunion tour. But his insecurity usually kept him too defensive and isolated to be warm and open. On that night, in a context away from the band, a context that didn't threaten him, I guess, it was truly enjoyable to be around Peter. He felt like an old friend for a change. My son Evan came, too. I was worried that he might be scared. He wasn't yet five years old, and the face I revealed when the mask was torn off was grisly. So I had him come to my dressing room at the Pantages Theater and watch them put my makeup on when the show was in previews. I wanted him to know it was still me underneath. I think it unnerved him a little. At one point, he looked at me and said, I love you, Daddy. It's still me, I said. It's just makeup, and I love you, too. I had done something similar before the Psycho Circus tour. I figured, at age four, Evan was finally old enough to see a show, but I worried about him seeing me in makeup without warning. I took my makeup box home before the tour, and we played with it together. I showed him how I put on the star and showed him photos of me in full regalia. I wanted him to connect the dots before he saw me like that at the show. After Evan saw me in Phantom, he started to sing the songs. I got him his own mini-me outfit with cape and mask, and he strutted around and sang. Every night when I occupied that character, I tapped into things buried deep inside me. The mask, the hidden facial disfigurement, it haunted me. The Phantom had it wrong. Christine recoiled in horror not at his face, but at his soul. Was it possible that the Phantom was, in a way, me? The mask, the hidden facial disfigurement. Why had I never confronted the birth defect I had covered for my entire life? Why had I cowered in fear of it? Why had I let it keep me from sharing myself with people, from embracing people, from embracing the fullness of life? The mask, the hidden facial disfigurement. Was the problem really in my soul, too? And if so, could I exercise it? Chapter 56 I was supposed to have been the second-to-last Phantom before the show closed after its ten-year run in Toronto. But things went so well that the theater bought out the contract of the actor poised to replace me and had me take the show to the finish line in October 1999. 
I enjoyed the pressure of knowing some people wanted me to fail and of changing the minds of others who thought I was some bozo ruining their favorite show. Of course, it wasn't always smooth sailing. One night during a scene where I was hooded and singing Point of No Return, a hushed moment with just the Phantom and Christine on stage, I went absolutely blank. I was walking toward her, singing solo, and I forgot the words. I knew from rock concerts that people notice your reaction to mistakes more than they notice the actual mistakes, so I just kept singing, in gibberish. Eventually my mind cleared. After the show, I went to see Melissa Dye, the great-looking woman with an incredible voice who played Christine. Melissa was a joy to work with, and her support and friendship made the whole experience that much more fun. Plus, there was something between us that under different circumstances, I definitely would have pursued. Wasn't that unbelievable, I said to her? What, she said. I was just singing nonsense during Point of No Return. Melissa looked confused. She hadn't noticed. Other people in the cast told me that they'd had similar experiences and sung about chickens or ducks, whatever came into their heads. Before shows, the staff often dropped off letters that had been mailed to me at the theater company's office address. I liked to read them. One woman wrote that she had seen the show many times, it was her favorite musical, and that her sister had recently bought her tickets for her birthday. When she found out I was playing the lead, she had been disappointed. She was expecting the worst but was completely won over when she saw the show, and she wanted me to know that. Another letter, the one from the woman who worked with About Face, changed my life. The woman, Anna Pileggi, wrote that when she watched me play the Phantom, she had the impression that I identified with the character in a way she hadn't seen in other actors. Wow. It was true, of course, that I identified with the character, the mask, the hidden facial disfigurement, But how did she figure it out? I rarely mentioned my birth defect to anyone, and these days I had the surgically created ear where earlier there had been the stump. It felt as if Anna had pulled aside a veil and seen the real me. She knew my secret. The woman's letter went on to describe About Face, the organization that helped children with facial differences. Would I have any interest in learning more about the organization or perhaps even working with them? I called her. Her connection to young people struggling with facial abnormalities struck me immediately. She didn't know my secret, of course, though I quickly told her about my microtia and the surgeries I'd had. She had just seen something based on her work. Perhaps she had recognized the pain of reality in the way I played the role. She described some of the programs her organization undertook. Eventually, she asked if I might be willing to talk to kids and their parents about my experiences. Here, perhaps, was a way to help heal my soul. I took a deep breath. Yes, I said. Speaking about my birth defect would have been impossible when I had been in the midst of pain and turmoil. My life had evolved, however, and I was now in a better position to be open. I suppose I could have gone to speak to the kids and just offered a cheering up from a so-called celebrity. But I knew I wasn't going to do that. I wasn't going to just speak to the kids... I was going to reveal something about myself. This was an opportunity for me to gain something by sharing with them what I had been through. I agreed to go to the About Face office and meet with a group of children and their parents. I had some anxiety leading up to that first meeting and talk, but my overwhelming and yet unanalyzed compulsion to do it eclipsed any fear I had. I didn't know what I would get out of the initial talks, but I knew I was compelled to do it. As monumental as my own condition seemed to me, I knew from speaking to Anna that many of these children dealt with far more severe facial differences. I didn't want them to think that I placed myself on the same plane as them, but I wanted to let them know what I had been through emotionally and where I had ended up. One thing I had noticed as a child was how much more difficult it was when nobody acknowledged the reality of the situation. There was nothing more isolating than having everyone act as if my missing ear and my deafness were no big deal. It didn't help me tackle the reality that I faced every day. So I wanted to explain that my life had been tough, lonely, and painful. I also wanted to acknowledge that it wouldn't be easy for them. Maybe nobody had ever told them that. Perhaps it would be a breath of fresh air for them to hear, yes, success is more difficult to achieve for someone with a facial difference. Happiness is more difficult to find. The odds are worse. 
I also hope to encourage the parents of the children to acknowledge these things, too. I wanted to impress upon them that it wasn't about tough love. It wasn't about sticking their heads in the ground. As soon as I started publicly talking about my ear, I felt a huge weight lift off of me. I realized that you couldn't appreciate others when you were immersed in your own misery. Perhaps that was what Christine meant about the distortion of the phantom soul. Suddenly, the world looked different to me, helping others help me heal myself. I felt freed from something that had been so painful and all-encompassing my whole life. Simply putting the truth out there in front of these kids and their parents had set me free. The more work I did with About Face, the better I felt. Eventually, we came up with an education program to try to help kids who didn't have facial differences change their attitudes toward those who did. In a video presentation, I told kids to imagine wearing what they thought was a special shirt and then realizing everyone was snickering and laughing at their shirt. You can go home and change your shirt, I explained, but kids with facial differences can't change their faces. I had never been so calm and centered as I was during those months in Toronto. A big part of it was finally coming to grips with my birth defect. Another part of it was doing something that demanded a lot of thought, effort, and discipline. Whatever the cause, the effect was to take me completely out of myself and allow me to think about my life and my relationships with some critical distance, with the kind of objectivity that's impossible when you are caught up in things. It felt like a time for self-evaluation and perhaps renewal. I had always thought my marriage was about breaking through a wall. Pam and I were going to resolve everything and finally push through to a great place on the other side. Then sitting in my hotel after a phantom show one night, it suddenly occurred to me. The nature of our marriage was banging our heads against the wall, not pushing through it. There is no other side. It was a heartbreaking realization. Another thing that occurred to me was that I had failed to break the pattern I had seen at home growing up. In some ways, Pam was very much like my mom, distant, cold, unsupportive, and not one to give a compliment. It was a shock to realize that the dynamics in my own marriage mirrored something I had sought to avoid. When I got back to L.A. from Toronto, I had some questions from my dad as well. There were pieces of the puzzle that seemed missing and feelings I was unable to identify. As my dad got older, it became clear that a day would come when I wouldn't have the option to ask him to fill in the blanks. One day when he was visiting me, I told him that I had been thinking a lot about the past as I stumbled into the future and that I wanted to ask him some uncomfortable questions. Thankfully, he said he was willing to try to help. So I asked him about the time he had come home late smelling of booze when my mom was out of town and told me that we all did things we regretted. What was that all about, I asked him. He paused. Then he said, I was in love with another woman. I was floored. I couldn't recall any instance when I had heard him say he loved my mother. He went on to tell me that he'd had a girlfriend for decades. He wanted to leave his family for her, but he couldn't do it. It suddenly flashed in front of my eyes the time my dad had spit his words at me for seeking psychiatric help. You think you're the only one with problems? It was because he didn't want to be there and he was living a double life, a lie. My stomach started to knot up, but I was determined not to let my face give away my shock and bewilderment. I wanted to hear as much as I could. She taught me the meaning of love, he continued. This was so far beyond the realm of what I considered possible. Skepticism flooded into my mind. Love was something you built over time through shared experiences with someone. My dad had never spent a night away from home, so it struck me as odd to place that kind of value, love, on something that was never tested beyond years of trysts. Was my dad describing it this way to justify his actions or sanitize his desire for sex? I felt that for my dad, his affair had to be sugar-coated, given redeeming value as opposed to just accepted for what it was, sex, which under most circumstances doesn't need any justification. Of course, in the context of a marriage, there are very few circumstances that justify an affair, though my dad seemed to be trying his best. One thing was clear. This was tangible evidence of what I'd picked up at home as a child— the more he revealed, the more I understood that those unspoken undercurrents, conflicts, and tensions that I'd grown up with hadn't been my imagination. 
I did not tell Pam about that conversation. Yes, my dad had made huge and stunning revelations, but Pam no longer felt like my partner. It would have felt like a breach of confidentiality to tell her. I wanted to talk about it, but I couldn't with her. If anything, that conversation with my dad spurred me on to avoid repeating the mistakes I'd witnessed as a child. I didn't want to get stuck in a loveless marriage. I'd been on such a high when I came back from Toronto, but I'd arrived at a house while hoping to return to a home. Whenever I tried to talk to Pam, she blamed our lack of closeness either on some outside issue she was dealing with, telling me all the ways in which I was falling short of her expectations. Most of the issues she brought up were everyday aspects of life, basic things that went along with living with someone, not things I felt were at the core of our problems. Finally, I said something to her in a way I thought would be very clear, expressing as basic a truth as possible. You can choose to be happy, I said, or you can choose to be gone. It's funny, even though we had separated before, I thought that if I made the choice as basic and clear as possible, the answer would be obvious. She would choose to be happy. I was surprised when ultimately she figured out that she'd rather be gone. In hindsight, with the exception of Evan, that was the greatest gift she ever gave me. I didn't want Evan to have to deal with a divorce while I was away, however, so while Pam and I agreed to end things, we also agreed to wait a year until I was home full-time after the conclusion of the imminent tour. The clock was now ticking. Soon, both my marriage and my band would be finished. Everything in my life was suddenly in flux as Kiss set out on the farewell tour in March 2000. Chapter 57 Peter posted a sign every day counting down the number of days left on the farewell tour. He started painting a teardrop below his eye. I thought it made him look like Emmett Kelly's famous Weary Willie character, the tragic clown who toured with the Ringland Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And as for the rest of his makeup, it was as if he had forgotten how to do it. He started to look like a panda bear with big rectangles around his eyes. The tour was horrible constant drudgery and misery. We spent all of our energy trying to coax Peter and Ace out of their hotel rooms. Ace sucker-punched Tommy at one of the shows. Peter had his usual handbook detailing how hotel staff had to treat him and which windows had to be covered with tinfoil and all that. There was no reasoning with either of them. We never knew if we'd make it to a show on time, and once we got on stage, we never knew whether we'd get through the show. I mean, if a guy has trouble putting on his makeup, how is he going to play? Not surprisingly, the shows could be pretty awful. I was angry at Peter and Ace for being disrespectful toward everything we had accomplished and everything the fans were giving us. I bought into the idea that this really was it, the end of Kiss. There was no place to go. It was unbearable. We were stuck in a rut musically as well, basically playing the same 17 songs we taught them for the initial reunion. This was the third tour with the same set list. Peter and Ace just couldn't master any more. The needle was already into the red. I had to come up with nonsensical interview responses to questions about why we were playing the same songs. I couldn't just say, because Peter and Ace can't learn any others. One night during a show, Doc McGee tried to get my attention from the side of the stage, gesturing up at me and holding his nose. Huh? You stink, he yelled. I walked over to him during a break between songs. What did you say? You stink, he repeated. Fucking Peter is playing too slow, I told him. Doc ran around behind the drum riser and started making the same gesture at Peter. Peter, you're playing too slow. Well, so are they, Peter shouted back. What are you talking about, Doc screamed. You're the fucking drummer. Another night, Peter had a new problem. He stopped playing in the middle of a song and just held his sticks up and looked at me like a deer in the headlights. I yelled, play, and started tapping my foot so at least he would start hitting the drums again. That happened on more than one occasion. A well-known musician who'd seen the band many times approached me one night and said, I can't come to any more shows. It's just too painful to listen to. The worst feeling was reading reviews trashing the shows and thinking, that's spot on. It was such a shame because the band could have been great and wasn't. 
The drama offstage and the hostility and resentment and backstabbing were taking a heavy musical toll. And then there were the drugs. When Ace had an off night and made a lot of mistakes, we would joke that his mixture was off. It would have been great to go out in a blaze of musical glory. Instead, we were dragging our asses. At one point, we put aside a few days to brush up on songs and tighten things up. Ace didn't show up for one of the rehearsals. He said he wasn't feeling well because he had Lyme disease, an illness brought on by the bite of a deer tick. Peter, brainiac that he is, said, That's bullshit. He was never bitten by a deer. Am I living in an insane asylum? On August 11, 2000, we had a show in Irvine, California after a week off. Ace had spent the week in New York. We had a rule that if anyone was going to fly cross-country on a commercial flight to get to a gig, he had to get there a day in advance, just to be safe in case there was a storm or a mechanical issue or whatever. We didn't want to have to cancel shows. The day before the Irvine show, Tommy had arranged for a limo to pick Ace up and take him to his flight. He always had the limo show up hours early because it was the same chore to get Ace out of his house as it was to get him out of a hotel. Then all of us sat around waiting for updates on Ace's progress. Ace's pickup was scheduled for noon East Coast time. At 1.30 p.m., Tommy called the limo. Mr. Fraley needs to get going. Um, sir, he hasn't come out of the house yet. Another half an hour passed. Tommy and Doc tried to get Ace on the phone, calling his house. No answer. After calling his house five more times, they finally got him on the line. Ace, you have to get in the car. You're going to miss your flight. There's a problem. Uh, I am sick. Millions of excuses. They kept rescheduling Ace on later and later flights. The limo went back each time. It got to be 7 and then 8 p.m. Passenger has not left his house, sir, reported the limo driver each time. Tommy managed to get Ace on the phone again. There's one more flight out tonight, last one. Okay, said Ace, I promise. But again, at the appointed hour, nothing happened. Passenger still not out of his house, sir. Flight missed. The next day was the show. Ace started the day on the other side of the country. By some minor miracle, however, he made it to the airport in the morning, was met by the on-site rep, and was escorted onto his plane. Traffic from LAX airport to the venue was going to present a serious problem, so we arranged for a helicopter to sit at Terminal 4 where Ace was arriving and shuttle him to the venue by air. That way he could probably make it in time for the concert. Then we got a call. Well, there's good news and bad news. Okay. The good news is that Ace really is on the plane. The bad news is that the plane has a mechanical problem and is delayed. At that point, Doc told Tommy to drop what he was doing and get to the venue. He was going to have to play the show. We traveled with a Spaceman outfit custom-fitted to Tommy as an insurance policy. A brand new outfit, boots and all, tailored to Tommy, always came along in one of the wardrobe crates. We knew Tommy could do it, but he had never actually done it. You guys are like superheroes, said Doc. So Tommy Thayer is playing Batman today? It's still Batman. Tommy got made up and dressed. And meanwhile, we were getting updates on Ace's location as the start time of the show approached. He's landed. Passenger is in helicopter. Fifty miles away. Ace walked into the dressing room about twenty minutes before the show was scheduled to start. He looked at Tommy, fully dressed and made up, with his guitar on, ready to go, and just said, Oh, hey, Tommy, how you doing? We delayed the show an hour, Ace got into his makeup, and we played the concert. The fact that we traveled with a costume for Tommy didn't seem to phase Ace. He thought it was a ploy, something between a joke and an empty threat. But we were 100% ready to go on with Tommy. We didn't have him suit up to teach Ace a lesson. We did it because we had a concert to play. The same reckless behavior that had led to a decades-long downward spiral was threatening to sink the ship. Here was a life preserver. Still, Ace continued to think and act like he was irreplaceable. He continued to show total disregard for everyone else, continued to act as if we were blessed to have him. He congratulated himself on making it to the show. This will not do, Doc said to me and Jean. These guys are just terrible. I run a management company, not the Red Cross. They don't send me into destroyed countries to rebuild things. I don't save people. You have to make changes. 
But still, Jean and I clung to the idea of the four of us being together. You've already given it three more years than I would have, said Doc. We decided to take the farewell tour to Asia in early 2001. Ace was on board. I personally offered Peter a million dollars to play eight shows in Japan in March 2001. He made the brilliant business decision to say no. Peter, I told him, I want you to understand. You get one million dollars or you get nothing, and the train leaves without you. Still no. Once again, what I was making was more important to him than the seven figures he would sock away. I told him I would call Eric Singer. The fans will never accept it, said Gigi, who was now married to Peter. Peter's the most talented one in the band. I just said, okay. Initially, Doc's talk about getting rid of Peter, and Ace for that matter, had been wishful thinking. No longer. This time, we'd all had it. It's one thing to put up with somebody who's a virtuoso and a prick. It's quite another to put up with somebody who can barely play his instrument and is a prick. I called Eric Singer just as I told Peter I would. To Peter's shock, the tour would go on. And Eric would wear the Catman makeup. At that point, it was clear that compromising the four iconic characters had been a mistake the first time around, and we wouldn't repeat it. The Catman, the Demon, the Spaceman, and the Star Child were far more important than Peter, Jean, Ace, and Paul. Nobody in Kiss is irreplaceable, and I definitely include myself in that calculation. All around the world, people can identify a picture of the band Kiss without necessarily knowing any of the members' names. So be it. Jean, Ace, and I got together with Eric to rehearse in L.A. before we left for Japan. What a breath of fresh air. The reality of playing without Peter was freeing. Peter was marginal when the reunion started, and his playing had gone downhill since. His drum solos were an embarrassment. Eric hated drum solos. That kind of tells you everything you need to know about Eric. Without Peter, the musical standard quickly improved. Even Ace picked up his game with Eric behind him. Even so, I wasn't sure what the reaction of the fans would be. Just as I hadn't been sure what the reaction would be when we took off our makeup years before. But overall, fans didn't seem to care. We didn't use any sleight of hand about the change. We introduced Eric by name at every show, and he got the applause he deserved for his playing. Nobody put a gun to people's heads and forced them to buy tickets, and yet the shows were just as full. We had labored unnecessarily under a self-imposed concept. It turned out there'd been no need. Few missed Peter, and Ace wasn't one of them. I don't want this to get back to Peter, but I'm glad he's not here, Ace said one night. He got me all worked up. I'm having a whole lot more fun now. With Eric back in the band, Ace actually started socializing with all of us again. He liked Eric on all levels and loved playing with him. We had band dinners again and hung out together in Japan and Australia where we added additional concerts into April 2001. Everyone got along better than ever. And in concert, Ace played the best he had since 1996. The vibe was great until the last show in Australia on April 13th. Ace had a rough show that night, and in some ways he was never the same again. The plan was to say farewell in Europe after that, but we had trouble pinning Ace down. He would say yes and then change his mind. Eventually he dropped completely out of sight. Nobody could get a hold of him, not even his lawyer. Finally, he showed up for a meeting to discuss another proposed European farewell, and he was shockingly thin. Over the years, he'd had a tendency to blow up and then get skinny again, careening back and forth depending on what he was ingesting at the time. But now he looked like he was going to die, and it was obvious that he was out of it. My God, Ace, how'd you get so thin? Yoga, he slurred. The shows never got booked. Chapter 58 With the European farewell cancelled, I had the time I felt was essential for me to help support Evan through the traumatic upheaval that lay ahead of him. After having it looming in front of me for a year, the time had finally come for me and Pam to divorce. The way I see it, we shared equally in all that happened. We chose each other, and from the very start we rarely met the other's needs or expectations. We chose poorly. Pam was a beautiful woman who was emotionally unavailable to me, which was a familiar dynamic. 
I was once again drawn to a challenge, seeking validation where it wasn't going to be given no matter what I did or didn't do. As for Pam, I know she felt minimized by my fame and success, although I'm sure she had hoped it would have the opposite effect on her. It was all futile and pointless. That was the lesson learned. We had been brought together to create and bring an extraordinary child into the world and then parent him without compromising him in our divorce or separate lives. We accomplished that admirably, and I will always be grateful to Pam for her commitment in making that our priority. Still, I had no idea how painful it would be. Pam and I sat at the dining room table with Evan, who was six, and explained that Mommy and Daddy weren't going to be together anymore. We're still going to be your Mommy and Daddy, and we still love you, and we'll always be there, but we won't be living together. He burst into tears. I told him that, yes, it was horrible, and that, yes, Daddy cried, too. I never tried to minimize what he was going through. I tried to acknowledge the pain and share it. Strangely, during our separations, Pam and I had been building a house. I'd found a spectacular piece of property in Beverly Hills with unobstructed views of the ocean. By the time all the red tape had been taken care of, plans had been drawn up and approved by the city, bids for the construction decided on, and actual ground broken, our marriage was descending into crisis. But the work was in full swing by that point and was best left to continue. At the time of our divorce, the house looked complete on the outside but was just a shell, as incomplete as our relationship. As Pam and I began the divorce process, it knocked me off my feet to find that the person I'd seen as my partner now saw me as her enemy. I had faith in Pam because of what she had told me years ago about not wanting anything if things didn't work out between us. And since in my mind this wasn't going to turn into a typical Hollywood scenario, I hired a very civil and reasonable lawyer. But then I found myself in a conference room in a mediation office, facing her and her attorneys and her forensic accountant advisor, feeling like I was having surgery performed on me without anesthesia. Finally, I said, there must be a misunderstanding here because Pam would never go along with what you're proposing. Pam looked at me and said, I know exactly what they're saying. This is business. My jaw dropped. My mind raced back to the unsigned prenuptial agreement and Pam's declaration that where she was from, your word was your bond. Apparently now she was from Beverly Hills, a place where words and bonds were quickly forgotten. Evan was never an issue. He was my son a hundred percent, and I would pay all his costs and expenses through adulthood without hesitation. Additionally, I had offered Pam a two million dollar house and told her that I would pay her expenses for five years and fund any classes she might want to take to prepare for the future. I didn't expect her not to want anything, of course, but I was shocked when the mediator asked her what she wanted, and she said, I want the same as he has. What? I had gambled my future because of this dream that I believed in, and she wanted the same as I had? How could she rationalize something like that? An astute attorney later told me, I've never met a woman who thought she got too much. But the law was on her side. To be in a room and have no control over my destiny was a situation I had never been in. I just had to sit there as people sliced pieces off of me. At some stage, my lawyer said, you might have to sell the house. Absolutely no way, I said. About that one point, I was adamant. The house meant more to me than its monetary value, It was the culmination of all my decades of hard work and my surgically repaired body. In addition to the shoulder work, my knees and hip were wrecked. It represented the freedom I had worked my entire life for. I'll do whatever I have to, I said. That house is mine. I ended up buying Pam a 6,800-square-foot house sight unseen that she chose in a gated community. It was important to me to have Evan nearby to make it easier for him to go back and forth between us. I almost felt guilty about the house that she said was just okay until I actually saw it. The place had a tennis court and a pool and was beautiful. When it was all settled and I was home one night, alone, without Evan, I collapsed to the floor in my empty house. I was devastated. There was a voice to the pain that came from deep inside, a guttural sound from some place that you never reach at other times. It happened several times. I would just buckle over and sob, and the sound would come out. I felt a sense of failure, even though I knew, at least in retrospect, 
that the marriage had been doomed from the start. We had failed to see that marriage should be the confirmation of a great relationship as opposed to a way to fix the problems of a relationship that wasn't great to begin with. It should never have happened, though I wouldn't trade a minute of it because Evan became a part of my life through the relationship. I thought back to my own childhood and something my mom used to say. Nothing bad ever happens. I hated hearing that back then. But now I understood what she really meant. Everything leads to something else. Evan was a gift from God, and having him come into my life was worth whatever it now cost me in pain or dollars. In fact, the thing that hurt the most was the fear that I had betrayed my son. I had vowed never to hurt him, yet I couldn't protect him from this. The most horrific realization was that I wasn't going to be able to see him every day, that I couldn't be with him whenever I wanted or whenever he wanted. In the wake of my divorce, people in the same situation told me that I needed to go out and start dating. You know, you need to have a life too. No, I don't. I saw other people go that route based on one rationale or another, but at the end of the day, I saw it as selfish. It didn't take into account what was best for their children. My child was going through incredible trauma, and my only concern was to make him feel safe. Bringing other people into the equation because I wanted to have company or get laid would be insane. How selfish could you get? The only thing that mattered at that point was Evan. My decisions would have a huge impact on him. I wanted to spend all my time with him, talk with him about whatever was on his mind. I bought a book called When Children Grieve that helped explain how children process and deal with grief and loss. I studied it. One afternoon, I was sitting outside my house thinking about all of this when one of the guys who had worked on the house came by unexpectedly to fix something. I didn't know him beyond a nod of hello here or there, but he must have known what had happened and seen how distraught I looked because he came up to me. I hope you don't think I'm overstepping my bounds, he said, but I can see what you're going through. I know you're going to think that I'm crazy and that this won't be true for you, but I got divorced and it felt like the world had ended. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just want you to know that I'm happily married now to the most amazing woman and have the most fantastic life now, and you will too. Just as he predicted, the first thought that went through my head was, you're crazy. I had no band. I was divorced. I had betrayed my kid. What the fuck am I going to do now? Through this period of intense pain, I still had few people to talk to or confide in. Divorce for me was something very solitary. Gene was on his own journey with his own way of protecting himself, his own armor. Therapy continued to be a haven for me, a place where I could talk honestly and express my stupidest, craziest thoughts. One of the things that therapy always did for me was to allow me to see that I wasn't as nuts as I feared I was, that my reactions were normal, or rather, that there was no such thing as normal, despite appearances to the contrary. Perhaps the person who helped me most of all was Michael James Jackson, the producer we had used for Creatures, Lick It Up, and Animalize. He's very intellectual and well-read and seems to see life in a more multi-level, complex way than most people. He knew I had been an art student and had noticed me sketching all the time during downtime in the studio. One day he said to me, You need to paint. I was taken aback. You need to get some of this out and explore some of it by painting, he continued. The idea resonated with me. Soon, Michael gave me some art books to try to inspire me, including a coffee table book on Mark Rothko. Finally, I went out and bought some supplies, canvases, brushes, a palette knife. I had no idea what I was going to do, but I was determined to give it a try. The first time I set things up and started to paint, it was like an out-of-body experience. I watched my hand move without thinking, and when it was done, I had a self-portrait. I felt a sense of relief and satisfaction, so I started another one, and another. I suddenly had a need to paint. Painting was like stream of consciousness with color, a purging. It allowed me to explore emotions without words. And then, in a sense, I could step back and look in the mirror to see what was going on in my life or how I was feeling. It was almost like an exorcism. I would exhale and sigh when I finished a canvas. 
I had a sense of having gotten something out of me. Eventually, I realized I hadn't heard that guttural sound in a few days, and then I hadn't heard it in a few weeks. I licked my wounds and moved forward. I started cooking a lot, too. It was important to me that Evan see that he and I could be self-sufficient, not to mention that I wanted to feed him healthy meals and give him the calm and stability of eating together. I learned to make chicken parmesan and pancakes. I learned to prepare different types of fish and vegetables. I mastered the waffle iron and the muffin tin. My meatballs became things of beauty. One of my favorite things to prepare was a Brussels sprouts dish I invented myself. Even people who didn't like Brussels sprouts, like Evan when he was a child, loved that dish. I cut the sprouts in half and pan-fried them with balsamic vinegar, dried cherries, and prosciutto, then finished them with Parmesan cheese and lemon zest. I found great pleasure in cooking and serving food, in giving. Evan liked to help with the cooking. It was just the two of us in the house most of the time, but cooking together helped make the place feel like a home, a family home. Once when my dad was at the house and Evan and I were cooking and playing, he said, Don't you give him too much love? You can never give a child too much love, I said. You can only give them too little love. Love doesn't make a child weaker. It makes a child stronger. That was an odd one for my dad to hear. If I ever heard someone telling Evan not to cry, not to be a baby, anything like that, I made a point of telling Evan the truth that I had discovered. People who hide their emotions are weak. You find strength and peace by being open. Chapter 59 After my divorce, I might as well have worn a hat that said, No Drama, on it. That became a mantra. I didn't want actresses and models. I didn't want anyone whose sense of self or mood was subject to whether or not she got a part or did well at an audition. I now knew that the drama I had earlier mistaken for fun, exciting, and normal, a basic component of a relationship, was actually tumultuous, counterproductive, and unnecessary. Emotions? Yes. Drama? No. I wasn't going to waste time. I wasn't going to compromise myself or portray myself as something I wasn't. I wasn't going to second-guess people and try to be what I thought they wanted. No drama. I knew now that I should expect someone to love me for who I was. One night in late 2001, I met Michael James Jackson for dinner at Ago Restaurant on Melrose. A group of women sitting at the next table included Tracy Tweed, who was the sister of Jean's longtime girlfriend, Shannon, and whom I had dated. We said hello, and I went back to my conversation with Michael. Then another friend of theirs came bounding into the restaurant and over to Tracy's table. I was absolutely captivated by her. I decided I had to talk to that woman. I was compelled as if by an unseen force. If there was ever going to be a moment that proved to me the existence of God, and I do believe there is a God, then this was it. Sure, some people might choose to call it luck. To me, luck is taking advantage of a situation God puts in front of us. The woman's name was Erin. She was as tall as me and had a great laugh, and she was a practicing attorney. I called her the next day and asked whether we could have dinner. Either we could go out or I would cook for her on a night when Evan was with his mother. If you like seafood, I could make a swordfish with Dijon mustard and capers, maybe serve it with some pasta and, oh, I don't know, maybe broccoli with garlic and lemon and olive oil? She agreed. Apparently, her friends had already given her the green light. They told her it was safe to hang out with me. She went for the swordfish and came over to my house, where we drank wine and ate and talked for six hours straight. My newfound love of cooking was paying off. From the moment Erin and I met, we were totally honest with each other. She knew what I was going through, and I was very clear about my parameters for a relationship. I let her see everything about me but she was understanding and nurturing, and she wasn't threatened by who I was or what I'd done. She was extremely bright and was confident in who she was. If anything bothered her, she told me about it. There was zero drama. We didn't rush into a monogamous relationship, but on all levels, there was definitely a great attraction there. Meanwhile, there was a little burst of activity on the kiss front. In February 2002, we were scheduled to play rock and roll all night for the closing ceremony of the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City. 
The Sunday broadcast was supposed to attract something like a billion viewers, so even though it was a lip-sync job, we wanted to rehearse it beforehand on Friday and Saturday. Gene, Eric, and I all arrived as planned on Friday, rehearsed that day, and rehearsed twice again on Saturday. Ace was still a no-show on Saturday, so we had to call Tommy, who was on vacation with his family in Hawaii. Poor Tommy had to fly in and stand by to fill in, since there was no way to know whether Ace would turn up in time. In the end, Ace did appear at the last minute on Sunday and perform the song with us. He was severely testing my low tolerance for drama. We'd also been asked to do a private gig in Jamaica about two weeks after the Olympics debacle. A Russian oligarch offered us $1 million to play for about 300 people at his 30th birthday party. Ace wouldn't do it. He was so paranoid by that stage that he thought the whole thing was a dastardly plot to get him out of the country so Gene, Doc, and I could have him assassinated. That way we could replace him and not have a problem. Replacing him was easier than all that. If Ace didn't want to go, Tommy could do it. End of story. Again, this was no mystery. Tommy had his own costume already, which was no secret to Ace. Tommy knew every song the band had ever recorded. I had no doubts about Tommy. We wouldn't have had him suit up all those times if we weren't confident in him. Without demeaning the role of actually being in the band, Tommy just shifted from one position to another. He was already part of the family, and now he took a step to the right, from being next to the band to being in the band. He was more equipped for the task than Ace ever was. The gig itself was strange. Everyone who wasn't a guest had a gun. Eric and Tommy opened the door to spontaneity. With them, we could play a song we hadn't played in ten years. They both had the knowledge and ability to spit out a song from any era of the band. After those gigs on the heels of the farewell tour, I truly bought into the idea that this was the end of the band. It was a shame, because even though it was a spur-of-the-moment thing, with Eric and Tommy, the band was firing on all cylinders. In a lot of ways, it was the band I had envisioned when we started the reunion, an idealized version of the band, with the iconic characters and the chops to match. Damn. I had no idea what I was going to do next. I thought about making music on my own. I thought about doing more theater. Losing Kiss was like losing a family member. It had been such a big part of my life, I felt a huge void. One afternoon later in 2002, I took my car to the car wash and one of the workers said to me, Paul, the farewell tour was great. When are you doing the 30th anniversary tour? What? That would be okay? You mean you still want us? The guy at the car wash really opened my eyes. He still loved the band. He wanted to know what was next. I'm the one closing the door. I'm the one throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but why? All of a sudden, I wondered what we were really saying farewell to. Maybe the farewell tour was better envisioned as a farewell to those two guys. A farewell to compromising ourselves musically. A farewell to drama. The idea of throwing it all away because of a pair of jerks who never valued the band suddenly seemed crazy. We had existed without them before. Now, because those two had come back into the fold, I was going to let them have their way by causing the demise of Kiss? Why stop now? We had built the band back, and people had embraced it. Hell, put on a good show, and Kiss could go on for another 200 years. And without the weak links, this band could put on a great show. I didn't want to give up something I'd spent 30 years busting my ass for. I'm not done. Part 6. Forever. Chapter 60. How much could we alter the equation and kiss? That was the question the Aerosmith camp raised when the idea of a co-headlining tour was floated. Doc was sure he knew. Gene and I were sure, too. Under other circumstances, both Ace and Peter would have been out for the 2003 tour, but for whatever reason, the Aerosmith camp wanted at least three original members involved. By this point, Ace had already made it clear he was done, which left Peter as the third member. Ugh. There were contracts to be signed by Peter, Gene, Tommy, and me. 
Of course, the four of us discussed it, and the members of the band were spelled out. After the Jamaica gig, it was a given that Tommy would wind up in the band. It was a logical progression, so much so that we never even spoke about it. After Jamaica, we knew we didn't need to audition for a new guitar player. Tommy was the answer. Tommy had been a great tour manager, not because he was destined to be a great tour manager, but because he gave himself totally to anything he did. And when he officially joined the band as the new lead guitarist, it wasn't that we took our tour manager and dressed him up in a spaceman outfit. Tommy wasn't a doppelganger or a substitute. He was the next step and had proved that he deserved to be in the band and that he enhanced it musically. As we started out on our co-headlining tour with Aerosmith, however, I have to say that Tommy and Peter didn't feel like the secret formula to me. It still felt transitional. It felt like the wound was only partly healed. Certainly we had somebody who wanted to be there, who knew the songs, who could play them consistently night after night. And I didn't wake up every morning wondering how the day would go and how the show would go. Fifty percent of the uncertainty and chaos had been eliminated. Peter, on the other hand, was up to his same old tricks. He had Gigi pouring a little more poison down the well each day. He complained incessantly about being disrespected by hotel staff. He bitched about the smoke from the pyrotechnics. The hotel guidebook was back, too, along with complaints that his room was too dark or it was too far down the hall, the shows were too long, his hands hurt, on and on. But the response from audiences was encouraging. There were cheers for Tommy, everybody on their feet, just as it had always been. If it sounded like Kiss, looked like Kiss, and commanded like Kiss, it was Kiss. Meanwhile, Peter had his attorney trying to negotiate a contract extension during the tour. His demands, as usual, were absurd. I think they figured we would cave because Ace wasn't around anymore. Who knows what they were thinking? I knew by then that Kiss was bigger than any of the individuals. And I do not mean except me. I have a high regard for what I do, but I don't fool myself by thinking I'm the only one who can do it. Strangely, the longer the negotiating went on, the more Peter and his attorney seemed to think they had us over a barrel. We went along with it. When the tour was over and Peter's contract expired, I told him we had decided not to renew his contract. You're not happy. You say the shows are too long. Your hands hurt. You want to play other kinds of music. We want to continue. I think it's best for everyone if we just call it quits, Peter. It's time for us all to move on. I didn't have much to say beyond that. It wasn't that we were just going to become a different kiss or a new kiss. We were going to become a better kiss. I couldn't change Peter any more than I could have changed Ace or Bill Coin or Donna or Pam. What I could do, however, was stop battling someone whose agenda was resolutely negative, someone who seemed intent on sabotaging everyone and everything around him, and then blaming anyone but himself. Fuck that. The idea that we would stop using any of the four iconic images was as ridiculous as the idea that we would stop playing any of the songs. Interestingly, years before, when we decided to try to buy the rights to the Catman and Spaceman images, Peter and Ace dealt their characters away as if they had no value. To them, they were mere bargaining chips. The fact that they so readily relinquished them showed me how little they cared about them. I was glad that those guys couldn't start turning up at Halloween conventions signing autographs in tattered kiss outfits and makeup. I valued the images and wanted to protect them. Eric Singer had been phenomenal when he filled in on the farewell tour, and again it was a case of not needing to look any further. We had our man for the future. It was such a relief. Touring was a part of my life that Erin knew nothing about. Back on the road, I missed her and wanted her to be with me and experience it firsthand. It seemed so strange to see her walk into this until then unknown realm of my life. She was a joy. When Erin came to her first kiss show, I remember seeing her in the audience dancing. She wasn't showing off. She was reflecting the elation I felt on stage. During a break from that tour, I took Erin to a charity dinner as my guest. When the host of the dinner mentioned me by name, Erin was the first person standing and clapping. I had never experienced anything like that. She was so secure in herself that she could happily give like that without feeling she was compromising who she was. 
The first trip we took together was to Las Vegas. We went to my favorite restaurant at the Bellagio called Picasso, that she loved the whole fine dining experience and meeting the executive chef there, Julian Serrano, who had become a friend of mine. As we were lying in bed later that night watching TV, I said I was thirsty. Aaron said, oh, I'll get you a drink. I thought it was just an empty gesture and said, no, don't be silly. But she got up and looked for the mini bar. There wasn't one. I'll go down to the lobby and get you something, she said, pulling on some sweats. You're going to go down to the lobby and get me a drink? I don't mean to sound like a kicked dog, but nobody had ever done something like that for me before. Erin would never do something that took away her pride, but she wasn't tangled up in bullshit. Being kind and giving wasn't a negative to her and didn't chip away at her sense of self. From time to time, we talked about the state of our relationship, where she was, where I was, how my home situation was unfolding. We always remained on the same page. A healthy relationship makes you healthier. I guess I realized only in retrospect that a dysfunctional relationship is a pretty good indicator of where you, yourself, are. Only someone in turmoil stays in a tumultuous relationship. Erin wasn't like that at all. I had really never met anyone like her. For the first year she and I dated, I never took her home when Evan was there. He had gone through a calamitous event in his life, and he needed to know he was safe rather than seeing me bring women around. Evan was in a situation he hadn't asked for, and the idea of getting on with my life without paying attention to his needs seemed transparently self-serving. I wanted Evan to know that our home was for the two of us. It was our world. One way I tried to declare this was to have a massive floor-to-ceiling fresco of the two of us put into my bedroom. The house was not a home when Pam and I divorced, so I decided to make this fresco the centerpiece, both as a way to lay claim to the space and to illustrate the world I wanted to create for Evan. It was based on a 19th century oil painting, a hunting party, Greek gods, nude maidens, cherubs, the works. Only I had the artist place me and Evan front and center, wearing togas with laurel wreaths around our heads. In the landscape around us were horses and dogs and dozens of bare-chested nubile maidens. An extreme example of poor bachelor pad taste? No way, no, no, no. For some reason, I thought this massive fresco was absolutely spectacular and something to display with pride. Erin, it would turn out, did not share this opinion. After Erin and I had been seeing each other for more than a year, I thought it was time to introduce her to Evan. But again, I didn't want him to feel threatened, so I decided to have them meet in a neutral location. I told Evan I had a friend who, like him, loved candy. I said we were going to visit a candy store at a shopping center, and she was going to meet us there. She came and met Evan, but I never held her hand or kissed her. Only slowly, over the course of many months, as Evan learned to get used to her and like her, did we start to reveal our affection a little more. As he became closer to Aaron, I allowed him to see me and her becoming closer as well. It was a parallel course. I hope that in his eyes, our relationship was evolving in front of him. Pam and I never badmouthed each other to Evan, and for that, I'm so grateful to her. Neither of us wanted him to become a pawn in any disputes between us. I see things very simply. If you want to take it to logical extremes, it all boils down to one basic question. Do you hate your ex more than you love your child? As long as you love your child more, there's no basis for bad words or denying access or anything like that. Which also meant Aaron never represented a replacement or a threat. Further on down the road, Aaron, Evan, and I took a trip together. I wanted him to see that Aaron slept over sometimes, but again, I wanted it to happen in a neutral setting. We checked into a resort in Santa Barbara, and when we went into the room, Evan asked, Where's Aaron going to sleep? With me, I said. Oh, he said, without any surprise or discomfort, and we moved on. By that time in my life, I firmly believed we heal ourselves by helping others. My making Evan the center of things for me benefited everyone. It was such a joy to see a happy child. When Erin and I finally moved in together, she told me she wasn't crazy about the fresco in the bedroom. We don't have to lose it, I said. I mean, we can add you into it. You can be one of the maidens. You live here now. You can be on there, too. I hate it, she finally admitted. I've always hated it. 
I was shocked. Then suddenly I found myself chuckling. When I stepped back, it did look like something from This Is Spinal Tap. Why didn't you tell me sooner, I asked. Then I went to the storage room and grabbed some paint and a couple of paint rollers, and we painted over the thing together. Chapter 61 Sometime after Aaron moved in, Evan, who was about ten at the time, accidentally locked himself out on the balcony off his bedroom. Aaron and I were downstairs and didn't realize it. At one point I heard a noise but couldn't place it. Wait, was that somebody shouting? Suddenly it dawned on me that Evan might be locked out. Aaron and I ran upstairs. Evan was beside himself out on the balcony. We opened the door and he came running in, right past me and into Aaron's arms. Some parents might have felt insulted by that, but I thought it was the greatest thing that he felt that way about her. It assured me that their relationship was strong and loving, too. While on vacation with Aaron in Hawaii in 2003, a gallery owner approached me and asked about doing something for his gallery, something like signed guitars. I paint, I told him. He asked to see some of my paintings. After I showed him photos, he wanted to mount a show. Me? An art show? It sounded odd. Now, granted, this wasn't some swank New York gallery, but still. We organized the show, and I went back to Hawaii for the opening. We sold $35,000 worth of paintings, which certainly exceeded all my expectations, since I had never expected to sell anything. It was quickly clear to me that if credibility came from being a starving artist, I would have to cross that off my list. After that, I had the bug. I wanted to do the same thing on the mainland. Soon enough, I had a deal in place with a chain of galleries around the country. We did a series of shows, and I felt as if I was exposing some people to a potentially enriching experience of culture, the visual arts, who might not otherwise get exposed to it. The same thing had been true when I did Phantom of the Opera, where I'm sure some KISS fans made their first foray into musical theater. I felt I was breaking down some of the snobbery that I think ultimately does a disservice to the arts. People sometimes would come up to me at a show and tell me, I don't know anything about art, but I like this piece. What do you need to know, I would say. Something either moves you or it doesn't. I found it gratifying when people said a piece made them think of something from their own lives or sparked them to tell me a story about their own families. Seeing people affected by my paintings validated my work in a way I probably never would have experienced otherwise. Bill O'Coin came to one of my art shows. He had leveled out, and it was great to see him again. Bill was warm and supportive. As the friendship was rekindled and Kiss began to tour again with Eric and Tommy, Bill came to a few concerts as well as more art shows. Over time, we did a good deal of talking about the past. He told me how he had seen me as defensive and unhappy in the early days, unfulfilled, guarded. He loved the transformation he saw in me, what he called growth. He loved Aaron, and he made a big point of how happy it made him to see that I had evolved to a better place. I was touched. Eventually, I would take a break from showing my art, even though my sales had by then passed the $2 million mark. I had started painting as a way to let off pressure. It was something I did without a schedule, without anyone asking questions. Painting was a big commitment since I had no training. It took a lot of time and effort and thought. There was no need for me to turn it into a business. I didn't want it to become a chore, especially as the band began to tour regularly again. One day back in L.A., Aaron and I were chatting about the state of our relationship. We started talking about her mother, who had spent decades working as an elementary school teacher. So what does your mom think is going to happen between us, I asked. What does she think of this whole thing? Oh, Aaron said, my mom thinks either it will move forward at some point or it will fall apart. It hit me at that moment. This isn't going to fall apart. I couldn't imagine not being with Aaron. I knew then and there that I wanted to be with her forever. We'd been together several years at that point. It wasn't a passing infatuation. Our relationship wasn't about love at first sight. The depth of my feelings for her grew out of our experiences together. It built over time. 
I called a jeweler in New York City and asked them to send me one of their booklets. Next, I picked out a stone. When the ring was finished, I carried it around waiting for the right moment to ask Aaron to marry me. But I couldn't find that moment. We took another trip to Vegas in 2005 and returned to Picasso for a great meal. We both loved the place and were enjoying ourselves and drinking the wine pairings. I got pretty buzzed, in fact. I had figured this would be the place to pop the question, but I wanted to propose to her with a clear head. The next day, I kicked myself. Fuck, when am I going to do this? A friend of mine had lent me his private jet to fly home on, which is something I never imagined I'd say in my life. I thought perhaps that would be the perfect place. The sunlight at 40,000 feet would make the ring really shine. But when we got on the plane, all my neurotic tendencies came into play. Damn it, these windows are polarized. I won't get a sparkle on the ring. We landed back in L.A. and drove home. I have to do this. We got home. Off our bedroom is a balcony overlooking the pool and guest house. More things I never envisioned in my life. It was a beautiful sunny day. Come on out here, I called to Erin from the balcony. We should go for a swim. She walked out onto the balcony. We had literally just walked into the house, but I couldn't wait any longer. She was leaning over the railing, looking down over the pool, and I stood behind her wrapped my arms around her, and held the ring before her eyes. Her reaction was a cross between panic and crying as she blurted out, Oh, my God! She didn't seem to know what to do. Will you marry me, I asked. Yes, she said. Then we called her mom to tell her the news, that we were moving forward, not falling apart. We planned the wedding in a single afternoon. Everyone said they'd never seen anything go so quickly. But I thought, hey, if we want peach-colored flowers, what does it matter what kind they are? People tend to get hung up on minutia when it's really about celebration. Oh, we need to have these certain flowers from Africa. Screw that. I did spend time picking every song the band would play, however, and since I wanted to go deep into the Motown catalog, we got a horn section, multiple singers, and percussionists. It was an incredible sound, gloriously loud and unrelenting. The outdoor wedding took place at the Ritz-Carlton in Pasadena in November 2005 with a relatively small group of friends and family. As thin and beautiful as Erin is, she loves candy. So we arranged to have a candy bar there, every kind of candy, stuff I'd never seen, stuff that looked to me like a science project. She was in heaven, and so was I. We danced and danced and danced. Chapter 62 Tommy and Eric came to the wedding, but Jean wasn't invited. I told him well in advance. I didn't want to go through the motions of inviting him just because he was my musical partner. He didn't belong there. He was well known for his views on marriage, calling it an institution that he didn't want to live in. Your views on marriage are your own, I told him. But when you insult and demean people who get married and ridicule or dismiss the idea of marriage, you have no place at a wedding. How somebody votes in a presidential election is one thing, but why ridicule people or the validity of their beliefs? It would have been insulting to have such a vocal opponent of marriage, somebody who went out of his way to say things I found offensive about the rationality and importance of marriage at my wedding. He got it. But his opinions on marriage also began to shift. By the next year, when Tommy got married in 2006, Jean was very supportive, and Jean eventually married Shannon Tweed, his girlfriend of more than 25 years, in 2011. Two months after Erin and I were married, we found out she was pregnant. We were ecstatic. Having children was always our plan, and we weren't waiting to get started. I was 53, and Erin was 33. During the pregnancy, reading books, going for sonograms, and searching for possible names only bonded us more. Erin looked incredible pregnant and loved every minute of it, which made the time all that much more joyous. Evan, too, was thrilled with the news, which put to rest any fears of mine that he might be angry or resentful. His only demand was that he be the first one to join us in the delivery room to greet his new sibling. Once we found out we were having a boy... 
We went through hundreds of names and combinations before deciding on Colin Michael. Funny how after he was born, all of the other possibilities we had considered seemed so wrong. Colin's birth was a completely different experience from Evan's. Aaron started having contractions in the middle of the night, and I was there with a notepad timing the contractions and writing everything down. Eventually, we drove to the hospital. Again, I set up my tripod and video camera. I told the doctor who was going to deliver the baby that I wasn't squeamish and wanted to be involved in the delivery as much as possible. When Aaron was in the final minutes of labor, the doctor turned to me and said, Get your gloves on. After a brief moment of panic, I pulled on some gloves, and as this little miracle began to emerge, I was told to pull him out. It was surreal as I lifted this little life out of the only world he had ever known and brought him into ours. Colin's birth was another moment of deep connection with God and all the generations before me. He, too, would be my legacy and my connection to both past generations and future ones. I had sometimes worried during Aaron's pregnancy how I could love another child with the same depth and effortless commitment to giving my all with which I loved Evan. That fear evaporated as I held Colin and realized that we have an unlimited capacity to create and give love. I would dedicate myself yet again to another amazing little boy, and together we would find out all that we could learn from each other. Outside my growing family, Gene and I still fought on occasion. His use of the KISS logo and makeup and his self-promotion in the press escalated throughout the late 90s and beyond. I saw the term marketing genius used in reference to Gene quite frequently in the wake of subsequent tours. It turned my stomach. Contrary to the notion that Gene spearheaded or maximized our merchandise empire, the truth is that over the years, the vast majority of licensees have sought us out and all solicitations go through our product development team. Neither Gene nor I has had an active hand in any significant deals. He was no marketing genius. He just took credit for things. It was unwarranted, selfish, and hurtful, and there was no way to excuse it. Calculated strategist? Sure. Genius? No. After the farewell tour, I saw sketches of a concept for a cartoon series Gene had sold. The cartoon character was basically Gene in Kiss Makeup. It was about a guy in a band. Hey, man, that's a Kiss entity, I said. Oh, no, this is not a Kiss image, he said. It's totally different. That kind of stuff still riled me up. There he was sitting across the table from me, lying about something that clearly fell under our partnership agreement, and he knew it. Do you think you're talking to one of the other idiots you're in business with, I asked him. Are you kidding me? That got settled real quickly. Fairness prevailed but not by Gene's volition. Beyond the anger I felt each time he showed such blatant disregard for our partnership, my feelings were also hurt that the guy with whom I had built all of this would treat me, when it served his purposes, with the same indifference I often saw him exhibit in his dealings with people I knew he didn't care about. Still, despite the hiccups, Gene and I have never gotten along better than during the past decade. We have very few points of contention these days. We've been friends for more than 40 years and have built great lives for ourselves. I think that over time I came to recognize the fundamental difference in our personalities. I wanted to improve myself and remedy the issues that plagued me. But he chose to ignore his underlying issues and instead committed himself to creating an external facade and persona that unfortunately he felt required him to knock down anyone who threatened his singularity in the spotlight. Earlier, I could never understand why he didn't want to resolve issues he had. I could never understand why someone so intelligent wouldn't do something to make life easier for himself, and probably for me and other people around him. After all, I know the never-ending effort it takes to keep up a persona and maintain a front to shield yourself. Somewhere along the line, I came to understand that his attitude was, why bother? Once I reconciled myself to how different we were in that regard, our relationship became easier. Gene and I are very different, and that chemistry and contrast continues to be keys to our success. These days, we laugh at each other's quirks. Another thing that has changed is what I expect from Gene. I expect less. I'm more realistic. I'm very clear about what's acceptable to me and what isn't. 
I found the secret to a great partnership was knowing its limitations. If you don't ask of a relationship what it can't give you, you won't be disappointed. Forty years on, in an immensely fruitful and successful partnership, I express my thoughts regarding Jean with acceptance as opposed to animosity. He continues to have his meeting sitting behind a big desk in an office surrounded by wall-to-wall -wall cases filled with KISS merchandise, never clarifying the fact that rather than being the creative force behind it all, he is in reality just one of the four faces on each box. This stuff still goes on, but I'm okay with it. I still want credit for what I do and achieve, but in the wake of all the positive changes in my personal life, I have stopped caring as much. I now consider my life to be so rich that many of the other concerns that once were so important seem like a waste of precious time. What I have gained inwardly and outwardly from a happy marriage and family far outweigh what I might have been looking for as far as perceptions about the inner workings of KISS. Those perceptions were and are far more important and perhaps fulfilling to Jean. Life has to be about what you get in exchange for what you give up and the things I now hold dear aren't worth giving up for fleeting publicity hits. If you define yourself by deals and media coverage, you're always searching for the next fix. That's life on a hamster wheel. If you can't stop running, you aren't really free. You remain a slave if you don't figure out something internal to make you happy. The same is true as far as touring is concerned. We don't have to tour all the time. We are our own bosses. KISS is my work, and it's spectacular and rewarding work in so many ways, but there is room for a life outside the band. Every week I spend on the road is a week I don't spend with the people who matter most in the world to me. Those seven days are more precious to me now than ever before. After I married Aaron, I began to put parameters on what I was willing to do and who I was willing to spend time with. There would be no compromises. Life was too short for that. KISS isn't life. It's a facet of life. At times when Doc came to us with proposals for things, I began to say, I'd rather be home. Gene was always puzzled by this. You're going to say no to money, he would ask in utter disbelief. Yeah, I said. The question is, what's more money going to get me, and what will I have to give up to get it? For him, it was simple. As Doc jokes, when Gene is 95 years old, He'll be standing at the end of his driveway with his walker, flicking his tongue at passing cars. We all deserve to find happiness, and I hope Gene does, now and in the future. But to me, there's more to life. The money I lose by not doing a show won't change my world, but being away from my family will. I weigh one against the other. How much do I need? Sure, I'd always like to have more. Who wouldn't? But I don't need more if the sacrifice is too great. Not just to my wife and kids, but to me. Sometimes what I would miss out on isn't worth the money. My children turned out to be the ultimate resolution to issues that plagued me my entire life. You can't change your past, but you can change your life and the lives of those around you. I've come to terms with things about myself that I had to wrestle with, and as a result, I have more to give, because I know myself more. Having children allowed me a second chance at the childhood I never had. It's cathartic to raise my kids in a loving and nurturing way that I myself never knew. I've been able to give my kids the life I didn't have by treating them the way I wished I had been treated, by helping them feel the way I wished I had felt. Maybe not everyone is affected in the same way by what a family and a deep relationship can offer. As the things I missed most in life until very late, they mean the world to me. Truly sharing with somebody, bearing your soul to someone, having someone know your vulnerabilities and weaknesses and fears and doing the same for that person offers a calm and a sense of refuge that no hotel, no matter how luxurious, can rival. Chapter 63 All my feelings of love and pride for Kiss were amplified by starting to tour with Tommy and Eric as permanent members. I quickly realized that I would rather not perform any more than have to deal with people I didn't want to be around. I could never go back to the drama, the lowered standards, the disrespect for the craft. It would be whoring myself. It was amazing to have people in the band whose mentality was, 
what can I do to make the band bigger, instead of what can I do to make myself bigger? But if you make the latter your priority, it doesn't work. With Ace and Peter, that's the way it was. With Tommy and Eric, there was a work ethic. And it started with taking pride in what they did individually and what we did as a team. Of course a certain segment of the audience didn't want the reunion era to be finished. People occasionally dismissed Eric and Tommy as imposters. But when I stood on stage with them, I had the opposite impression. If anyone had been imposters, it was Peter and Ace during the reunion tours. Whatever ability those guys may once have had was long gone, or rather, long discarded. They were a distortion of anything they had ever been. With apologies to anyone who doesn't want to hear it, Ace and Peter simply couldn't play their instruments by the end, and they didn't care, which in my mind was perhaps an even bigger sin. If people want to talk about seeing the band as a meal ticket, they can't point at me or Gene. We were already eating well. Only Peter and Ace treated Kiss as a meal ticket, and even then they couldn't recognize their good fortune sufficiently enough to punch it. The new lineup of the band was much more the band as I envisioned it, and the way people heard it in their minds. I always wanted the audience to feel that we surpassed their expectations, and it had been a long time since we had been able to do that. With Tommy and Eric, we did it. The band could sing so well, in fact, that people constantly asked whether we used pre-recorded background vocals. Nope. We just finally had four strong band members. Through all of this, KISS wasn't just surviving, it was thriving. Once I rekindled my friendship with Bill O'Coin, he continued to come to occasional concerts. I loved the fact that we had both come to terms with personal demons. I loved where we both had ended up both in stable relationships and peaceful mental states. In a way, I found with Bill what I wasn't able to find in the band reunion. We were able to bring things full circle, put things to rest, and look back and enjoy what we had created together. Then over lunch in Florida one afternoon, he told me he had advanced stage prostate cancer. I asked what I could do to be helpful and Bill told me he worried about his partner, Roman, and what would happen to him if Bill lost his battle. I talked to Jean, and we decided to buy the condo they were living in and give it to Roman. At the end of a European tour in 2008, I rented a beautiful villa in Tuscany. The place looked like a three-story museum in the middle of the countryside. I made arrangements for Aaron, Evan, and Colin to join me there, along with my parents, Aaron's mom, her mom's husband, and my good friend and security man, Danny Francis. Aaron and I had been holding off on telling everyone some big news until we were all around the kitchen table eating a home-cooked dinner. We started our meal with a couple of bottles of Lambrusco, a bubbly red wine with no pretenses of chic or airs of high society. Then we told them. Aaron and I were expecting a baby girl. Funny thing about choosing names— We just weren't cool enough to name our children Pineapple or Astro Girl. We loved old school names and chose Sarah Brianna for our first girl. Colin's delivery had been an easy 25 minutes of pushing for Aaron, and we assumed Sarah's would be similar. No such luck. Sarah wasn't in the proper position in the birth canal, and ultimately a C-section was needed. Watching it performed was shocking and certainly bore no resemblance to natural delivery, but at the end of it... There was Sarah, who was absolutely gorgeous. Everyone commented on her angelic face and perfect upturned nose. There were some post-surgery complications that led to days of unspeakable pain and very real danger for Erin, including the risk of losing a kidney, and so I called some big guns I thankfully knew. A group of specialists descended on Erin's room like a SWAT team, and a series of quick tests found the root of the problem. Erin endured weeks of risky surgery to reattach things and reroute the problems. But thanks to a stellar team that included Dr. Stephen Sachs and Dr. Ed Phillips at Cedars-Sinai Hospital, Erin made a slow but full recovery. Once she and Sarah were finally home, I got to experience a bond I had always heard was so unique. The bond between a father and daughter. Sarah melted my heart and awakened a spot in it that she alone owned. In 2009, KISS went back to South America and found ourselves treated like visiting dignitaries. 
When we arrived in Sao Paulo, one of the world's most populous cities, it was rush hour and the freeways were gridlocked. Suddenly, about three dozen motorcycle cops shot ahead of our vans and cleared the entire highway between the airport and our hotel. The overpasses, on-ramps, exits, everything was blocked by the police so we four idiots could get to our hotel. It was unbelievable. Certainly, the motorcade of the President of the United States of America wouldn't have gotten better traffic control. At the end of the ride, we took photos with the cops. They were fans. Despite the fact that the new KISS lineup proved an immediate success and also had long-term durability, it wasn't clear we needed to go back into the studio. We certainly didn't need to do it for the money. And besides, the experience of Psycho Circus had left a sour taste in my mouth and totally turned me off to the idea of recording. I couldn't have articulated what exactly it would take to change my mind, but over time I began to figure out a set of prerequisites that might make it possible for me to make another KISS album. For one thing, I needed to have final say. I wasn't going to work on something I couldn't be proud of. I was through second-guessing things or being second-guessed. At least if we did something I loved, there would be one big fan, regardless of what else happened. For another, I wasn't going to work on an album unless everyone put in the same amount of effort. There wasn't going to be any sense of entitlement or special treatment. Everyone would have to earn their place, and I wouldn't put up with any mediocre songs just because of a sense of job tenure. And finally, I wanted to produce any new record. The idea of needing an intermediary between me and Gene or anyone else was ridiculous. I was too old for that nonsense. If there was going to be another Kiss album, it was going to be done properly without politics or ulterior motives. It was going to be great material and great playing all brought together with a vision. I did believe that this team, Gene, Tommy, Eric, and me, could put together a really great Kiss record. With the changes in the industry, we also had the chance to have total control from the songs and recording process to the marketing and distribution. And I thought it would be a shame to let Psycho Circus be our final statement. I knew that times had changed, so I had no expectations of sales at past levels. Success in my eyes would be measured in quality and realizing my own standards and expectations. The current band is so impressive and cohesive. We owe it to ourselves to step up to the plate. So in 2009, it was time to make a new Kiss album. Everyone got together to start writing songs. Another stipulation was that we do it all together as a team with no outside writers. When we finished Sonic Boom, we did a deal directly with Walmart to have not just our new album on sale there, but a store within a store with all sorts of merchandise and back catalog items alongside Sonic Boom. And when it was released, we debuted at number two on the charts. Bill O'Coin flew in for our show at Madison Square Garden in October 2009, just after the release of Sonic Boom. He said he was going to beat the cancer, but he was clearly very sick. He planned to come to our show at Wembley Arena in London in May 2010, but he had to cancel. A few weeks later, Roman told me that Bill's condition had taken a turn for the worse and he was in the hospital. I called Bill while we finished our European tour and Gene and I made plans to fly to Miami to see him as soon as the tour was over. When I checked back with Roman soon after, he said Bill was unconscious. He had developed sepsis. Roman put the phone to Bill's ear for me, and I thanked him for everything he had done for KISS. Regardless of what had happened later, none of the good things that happened in the formative years would have happened without him, I told him. I love you, Bill, I said. The last concert of the Sonic Boom Tour was in Belgium in June, and Gene and I stayed up all night after the show to catch the first flight to the States in the morning. We phoned Roman to let him know we'd be at Bill's bedside by that afternoon. When our flight landed and I turned on my phone, I saw there was a missed call from Roman. I checked my voicemail. Bill had passed away while Gene and I were on the way to say goodbye to him. Goodbye. Chapter 64 My life was as full as I could ever have hoped for with Aaron and my children. Evan and I shared a growing musical bond in addition to our bond as father and son. Colin, my little dynamo, was a perfect blend of rambunctiousness and cuddling who wrestled me with laughter and a determination to win. 
Sarah had grown disarmingly beautiful, a little drama queen who danced, sang, and had her mother's daring and spunk. What more could I have wanted or needed? Erin was very vocal about wanting to have one more child. I couldn't imagine having yet another, but judging by how quickly she was again pregnant, God had other ideas. And once our daughter Emily Grace arrived, I couldn't imagine life without her. She's clearly part of a plan I didn't understand. Although she strongly resembles me, she's blessed to be another stunner like her sister. Stubborn, secure, and always laughing, Emmy is my angel. My four children have made me wealthy beyond anything I ever could have imagined. And it's a gift to know that. As I got older, my mother said on many occasions that I should call any time and at any hour if I needed to talk. I always found comfort in that, and when I felt the need, I did call her without hesitation. My parents' desire to be there for me as an adult was unfortunately often sabotaged for all of us by a disconnect in their own lives decades past, but I never doubted their love for me. How much could I really have hoped for when their own experiences from a young age left them unable to help themselves or each other? My mom and dad were good people who, over the course of their lives, tried to make their way as best they could with the cards they had been dealt. Frustrating and unsuccessful as many attempts were, they, like me, never stopped trying, and that is what I keep with me. When Kiss decided to start making another album, Monster, in 2011, the ground rules were the same as for Sonic Boom. Gene said in a few interviews that he didn't have the time to do the production work because of all the other things he had going on, which I, of course, found undermining and designed to imply that I was producing by default. The truth is, neither of those albums would have been made if I hadn't produced them. I wasn't aiming to be a dictator, just demanding to be a director. We went into the studio with a sense of pride, not with a sense of obligation. We wanted to challenge ourselves as well as build on what had come before. The long journey through different players, different lineups, different tours and albums had gotten us to the real kiss. This is the band. The four of us had a ball making the record. We collaborated as a band. A song like Wall of Sound began as an idea Gene brought to the table. Then Tommy found the riff and I added the lyrics. Eric said, let's make a song with a bit of the feel of the MC5 and came up with a drum part that became the foundation of Back to the Stone Age. The album came together from all of us working together, plain and simple. Monster isn't just classic Kiss, it's classic rock. It reminds me of why I love rock and roll and what made the bands that inspired me so great. Between Eric's authority, Tommy's fire, and Gene's undeniable ferocity, both in his bass playing and his vocals, Monster has a rare vitality. It sounds like the work of a new band. In fact, the album probably would have had a bigger commercial impact if it had been released by an unknown band. I get it. There's no getting around the fact that nothing KISS does in the future will have the impact of the things we did in the past. Those things took place in a different era. The world was different. The music business was different. The monolithic nature of pop culture was different. In addition, of course, the magnitude of something gets enhanced by the simple passage of time. As good as it is, Hell or Hallelujah can never be Love Gun. The classic songs have already been the soundtrack to people's lives for 40 years in some cases. There's no way to compete with that. None of the newer material has time on its side. But then again, when we play Lick It Up, it goes over gangbusters. What was once considered one of our new songs has long since acquired classic status to people who came to the party a little later. The song Psycho Circus is now a show opener and goes over better now than when it came out. Time is the ultimate judge. As we hit the road to celebrate Monster, one of my favorite parts of the tour quickly became the meet and greet before each show when we played an unplugged show without makeup in the afternoon for a small group of fans who had bought special VIP packages. We couldn't possibly have done the meet and greets with Ace and Peter. For one thing, they wouldn't have shown up. For another, they didn't know enough songs to do what's most fun about these gatherings, letting the fans make requests and then hashing out the songs on the spot, sometimes after not having played them for decades. It's a thrill to see the reaction of the fans, and we have a blast jamming there with them as if we're all in a living room. The band is so comfortable now, and capable. Admittedly, the VIP packages aren't cheap, 
but people actually thank us after the meet and greets. That, to me, is the ultimate testament to what we're doing. If someone pays you and then thanks you, you've done a good job. The current lineup of KISS has built a broad sense of community that wouldn't have been possible when we were burdened by all the inner turmoil of the old lineup. Doctors come up to me at the shows and say, you got me through med school. Former convicts say, you got me through prison. People tell me KISS helped them deal with the deaths of loved ones or battles with cancer. At a concert in St. Louis in 2012, I had arranged complimentary meet-and-greet tickets for a young man incapacitated by ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. He couldn't move or speak, but I thought I detected the hint of a smile in his eyes when we took photos with him. Also in the VIP tent that afternoon was a married couple who were buying an electric guitar I would play later that night on stage. Following our unplugged set, I talked to the man and woman for a while and determined how they wanted their guitar inscribed. After the wheelchair-bound man with ALS left the tent, the husband of the couple turned to me and said, We bought a second guitar for that young man. That stopped me in my tracks. The guitars I sell are intended for collectors and cost thousands of dollars. This couple didn't know the man in the wheelchair. They didn't know what his ailment was or anything else about him. They had simply seen him across the room. I told them I was moved by their gesture. We're very lucky people, explained the husband. We like to pay it forward. Their reward was the act of giving. Mine was to reimburse them the cost of the guitar. That same year, I met a woman in San Antonio who came to the show to celebrate her cancer being in remission for a year. Another night, coming off stage in Las Vegas, a police officer came up to me with a huge smile on his face. Destroyer was my first album, he said. The show was amazing. Oh, my God, I can die now. Please don't, I said. And then we hugged. I know I'm not Florence Nightingale, and obviously Kiss never was and still isn't a philanthropic movement or a humanitarian effort. We're four guys who play instruments. We're a rock band. And yet to realize our band can be an inspiration and raise awareness and contribute significant sums to worthy causes like the Wounded Warrior Project and various cancer charities is both humbling and deeply rewarding. Early in Kiss's career, I thought it was cool to see people at the shows having fun. Now I see the part I play in making them happy and find that very fulfilling. The time and consideration I can give to people, people who, for instance, are returning from military service or have gone through tough times of one kind or another, means so much to me now. It was nice when I was young, but it didn't go to the core of my being the way it does now. The more opportunity I have to treat people the way I wished I myself had been treated, the better I feel. It's also amazing how little it takes to have a huge effect on someone's life. It's tempting to say it would be sinful not to take advantage of such opportunities, but then again, there's a selfish element to it. I feel that I gain as much as the other person. I've taken some big leaps in my life, and the biggest ones have been in the past 15 years. Learning the value of kindness was a gift that came to me late, but it changed the game. Doing for others is now the most satisfying thing in my life, the gift I never knew. It's fulfilling in a way I could never have imagined when I was young. Back then, I thought I knew everything. It's amazing some of the things I thought I knew. That was sheer audacity. Being judgmental was a defense mechanism and a way to avoid looking at myself. It was rooted in fear and self-doubt. I didn't like myself. I'm Jewish and I believe in God, but I don't picture God as an old man with a beard and a robe sitting in heaven judging us. The thing I love about Judaism is that it's not about being good because of the consequences of being bad. It's about being good because it's the way we are supposed to be. Being good is its own reward. I'll buy that. When Evan was born, I read a book on interfaith marriages that said the problem in such families can be that children often don't feel fully part of one religion or the other because of tensions between the parents. When children fear they might be angering or betraying a parent, they're paralyzed. In our family, our kids aren't 50% Catholic and 50% Jewish. They're 100% both. I grew up around people who had numbers tattooed on their arms from being in concentration camps, and I feel a responsibility to them and to the six million others who were killed to keep their stories alive and make sure my kids know the history of Jews and Judaism. 
But ultimately, I'll let my children come to their own conclusions as far as what they want to participate in and believe. And I'll know they are deep, wonderful people regardless of their choices. I gave a speech at a high school graduation ceremony in June 2012 that emphasized the need to show compassion. I talked about my ear deformity and deafness and the way I shut myself off from others as a result. And then I came to the most important part, the part about realizing how I can help myself by helping others, how I can free myself from harsh judgment by not judging others. When someone asked for a handout, I said, it's easy to look down on that person or to say, get a job. America is a land of opportunity, yes, but not everyone gets the same chances. You have no idea what got that person into his or her situation. You don't necessarily solve anything by helping the person, but if you provide even a moment's respite from difficulties and pain, it's worthwhile. Plus, you'll feel good about it. That lost soul is one of God's children, and by being compassionate and kind, you open yourself up to a feeling of peace and contentment. Who am I to look down my nose at somebody? Judging others and being quick to criticize just pollutes your life. Learning how to open your hand is the best thing you can possibly learn. That lesson has been brought into our home as well. From a very early age, Evan's birthday parties were no-gift parties. What kid needs 30 gifts? How about learning what it means to give to others instead? Each year for his birthday, he picked a charity, and we collected money at his party to donate to his chosen cause. I would kill to be able to play guitar the way Evan can now, but I'm far more proud of the hard-working and compassionate human being he has grown up to be. As Aaron and I have nurtured our three younger children, we've tried to make them aware of their part in the world, too, and the responsibilities that come with it. To paraphrase Bob Dylan, you may know what you want, but not what you need. We all run around wanting certain things, but when you reach a point where you can distinguish between the things you thought you wanted and the things you actually need, That is an epiphany. In my case, it may have been necessary to get what I wanted in order to learn what I needed. Achieving all those things that I thought would make me happy, fame, wealth, desirability, confronted me at each milestone with the fact that what I had chased wasn't the solution. In each case, I may still not have known what I needed, but I could scratch another potential solution off the list. Not fame, not wealth, not desirability, I had to go through it all to find the truth. Fortunately, just because something turns out ultimately not to be the right road doesn't mean it ain't fun driving on it. I'm a firm believer that everything in my life has led me to where I am today. I have few, if any, regrets. After all, if I'd done things differently, perhaps I wouldn't have made it here at all. There were times when it was tough to get through the day, but even on those days I knew that if I fought my way through, there was something better ahead. When faced with misfortune, you can either sit in the shit or you can clean yourself off and move forward. In my case, I always chose to move forward. I didn't know how hard it would be to find my way, but I knew I wouldn't stop until I had. It was just a question of work. My quest to perfect myself, or whatever you want to call it, ended up teaching me the impossibility of that goal. It's not about being perfect, being normal, or seeking approval. It's about being forgiving of imperfection, being generous to all sorts of people, and giving approval. That, too, takes work. I'm not what I call a passive optimist. I don't believe everything will work out if I wish for it hard enough. I'm a realistic optimist. I know that as long as I'm realistic about my capabilities, I can make things work out, or at the very least, I can try to steer things in the right direction. On the one hand, no matter how hard anyone pictures himself or herself, say, flying, It's not going to happen. You can do something 10,000 times and still be bad at it if you have no aptitude for it. As far as I'm concerned, if you pursue something that's out of your reach, then you're a fool. Time is irreplaceable, and you are the only person who will bear the brunt of your misjudgments. On the other hand, realistic goals can be achieved through hard work. There's nothing wrong with limitations. If anything, you get farther when you realize what your limitations truly are. It's just that many limitations are either self-imposed or based on what other people believe them to be. You need to determine your own limitations and then work toward their outer limits. Evan called me from his dorm room during his first semester at college in the fall of 2012. He just had breakfast with Jimmy Page. Yes, that Jimmy Page. I thought back to being Evan's age. 
I'd been a lost teen with a dream and a commitment to making it come true, and Led Zeppelin was my biggest influence. Now Jimmy had one of my paintings hanging in his country home, and my son, the same age I was when, as a total outsider, I stared in awe at Zeppelin, hangs out with him. Funny how things can come full circle. Your life and destiny are determined to a large extent by your participation in the outcome. Think big, work hard. Dad? I snapped back from my reverie. Telling me about his breakfast with a legend wasn't why Evan had called me. The real reason he called was because he wanted to cook Brussels sprouts in his dorm room. Dad's Brussels sprouts, the way I made them at home. He needed the recipe. How cool. I explained how to pan fry them and told him how much balsamic vinegar, dried cherries, and prosciutto I used. And don't forget to top them with some grated Parmesan cheese and a little lemon zest. My younger children already like to help me cook. Lately, they've become interested in gardening. We decided to plant a family vegetable garden. Aaron and I went to a nursery and bought heirloom seeds and together with the kids planted tomatoes, sugar snap peas, strawberries, carrots, and broccoli. I watched in astonishment as these things that looked like lint balls eventually started to send up green shoots as the kids watered them day after day. As the plants started to grow, I found I too had a desire to nurture them so they would grow up big and strong. It was something I could never have imagined myself feeling. One afternoon, Colin, who was in elementary school, told me, I have some important work to do. Then he scurried out the back door. After a few minutes, I went out and checked on him. What could he be doing that was so important to him? He was kneeling in our vegetable patch, pulling weeds. Soon enough, we had a bumper crop of tomatoes, and the kids and I made huge vats of tomato sauce. We froze some, but we used a lot in lasagna and on pizzas we learned to bake together. I found a recipe for a thin crust dough. We all sat around mixing and rolling, and then we topped our pizzas with our homegrown tomato sauce and grilled them in a wood-burning stone pizza oven we had built in the backyard. There's something wonderful and almost therapeutic about making your own food from seed to table. If you told me 15 years ago that I would have photos on my phone of the lasagna I made with my kids, I would have called you crazy. But the photos are there. We have a family-friendly, food-friendly, wine-friendly household. We sit and eat together as a family, and I look forward to it every day. Sometimes I'm reminded of a sunny afternoon in the 1980s when I watched from the pool at the Sunset Marquee as the band Mike and the Mechanics checked in with their kids and strollers and nannies. I remember shaking my head, thinking it was the most uncool thing I had ever seen. These days, there's nothing I consider cooler than being on our jet with the kids running up and down the aisle, or standing on stage in front of 100,000 people at the Download Festival while my kids watch and wave from the side of the stage, or walking backstage and seeing Emily, Sarah, and Colin in their pajamas. It's amazing. And to have it at my age is even more amazing. Perhaps it's unusual to be 62 years old and have a two-year-old. Certainly, I feel blessed. People equate getting old with shutting down, with the joy seeping out of your life. But me, I'm in love with my wife. I love my kids. There's a part of my life that's over, but what's taken its place is so much more fulfilling. Sure, every once in a while I look at a hot young woman and think for a fleeting moment about what I will never again have. But when I think of what I have instead, it's no contest. That's also why I finally decided to write this book. Because despite the odds, I managed to go from a very unhappy place to a peaceful, harmonious place. If I found a path, no matter how long and arduous, to happiness and satisfaction, I firmly believe others can, too. It may not be an easy road, but sticking to that road and pushing forward is the most worthwhile thing you'll ever do. We tend to compromise through life and lower the bar. We settle for relationships or jobs because we're not sure that we can do better or that we even deserve better. But we can do better, and we do deserve it. Life is not about surrendering. Chapter 65 Because of the makeup, Kiss Today looks pretty much the same as we did 40 years ago. But the longer I keep at this, the more I realize that I'm not invincible. It's an ever more daunting task to get up there and sing and play guitar and dance and do it in a way that appears effortless. Nobody wants to see somebody killing himself on stage. 
I enjoy every minute of performing, but it has always been physically grueling, and it certainly is more so now. When I was younger, people asked me, doesn't it hurt when you jump up in the air and land on your knees like that? No, I said. Well, I wish I had their phone numbers, because all those years of doing jumps without pain have left me with a reminder. My knees hurt now. I don't know whether people in the audience can fathom just how difficult it is, or the extent to which they themselves make it possible. I could never jump around like that at a rehearsal. I depend on those people. I depend on the rush of adrenaline I get from them. Every night I find myself up there with a huge smile on my face, laughing, having a great time. It's a gift, and it's terrific that I love it and have fun doing it, and it's doubly terrific to look out into the audience and see other people loving it too. I never understand bands who say they're sick of playing their hit songs. I'm thrilled to play our big songs. I'm proud of those songs. And the people at our shows deserve to hear the music the way they love it. God knows how many times I've played Firehouse over the course of the past 40 years, but I still love it. When Gene, Tommy, and I rock back and forth to Deuce, it's the ultimate middle finger to the people who don't like us and the ultimate salute to those who do. Each night is the only night that counts to the people at that show. They weren't at the show the night before, and they won't be at the one tomorrow. I won't let them down. Most rock and roll is so age-specific or demographic-specific. Your favorite band can't be your older brother's favorite band, and God forbid it be your parents' favorite band. A KISS show is different. It's a gathering of a large, long-lasting society that transcends any demographics. There's nothing better than seeing people holding up their children during a show. People want to share this cult of millions with their kids. It means that much to them. Those people are happy. They're getting a break from whatever else is going on in their lives. Even as citizens of the world with a sense of morality and purpose, Everyone is entitled to a day off. All the problems of the world will still be there tomorrow. What KISS does is timeless. We sing about self-empowerment, celebrating life, believing in yourself, and sex. It ain't a crime to be good to yourself. Is there anything more truthful than that? We're all here one time, and why should anyone but you get to decide who you love and how you spend your time? We sing about the joys of being alive. On the Sonic Boom Tour, Gene, Tommy, and I would get into a caged-in platform behind Eric's drums before the first song started. As we played the first song, the platform would go up and over the drums and eventually put us down at the front of the stage. It was a spectacular effect. I can't tell you how many times as we came over the top and I first saw the audience, I got choked up and teary-eyed. I looked out over the crowd and was amazed. What a blessing. My God. Had somebody told me Kiss was going to last 40 years with no end in sight, that I would be wearing the same outfit and not getting laughed off the stage, that on the contrary, we'd be selling out arenas and stadiums, I would never have believed it. I think the longer we've survived, the more potent we've become. There's something inspiring about longevity. There's something inspiring about going against the odds and thriving. Perhaps the best way to win is not to play the game. Twenty or thirty years ago, I couldn't imagine the world without me, much less the band. But at some point, you can't ignore the reality of your own mortality. I won't be physically capable of performing in KISS forever. Something I've come to understand, though, is that I'm not immortal. The band is. Nowadays, I don't confuse my role in the world or the band. I realize that KISS could and should go on without me. KISS isn't like other bands. We've never subscribed to the limitations other bands impose on themselves. People come to see the characters we created and what those characters represent. It's not me they're coming to see, but what I embody. There was a time when people said nobody in this band could be replaced. It had to be the four of us. Well, they're already 50% wrong. And they're going to find out at some point that they're 75% wrong and then 100% wrong. I'm objective enough about myself to realize that no matter how good I am, and I think I'm damn good, there's somebody else out there who can do something equally valid. I think that being replaced would be a huge compliment, not a detriment. It's part of what I hope we've built, an ideal that goes far beyond me. Causes go on, political parties go on without their founders, 
I think someone could come along who would be capable of carrying the flag just as well, if not better, someone who can build on the foundation. I look forward to the day that I'm replaced in KISS. Not because I want to leave, but because it will prove I'm right. KISS is bigger than any of its members. I've always said that I'm not just a member of KISS, I'm a member of the KISS Army. I look forward to watching the band I love continue to rock and roll all night, long after my body is too shot to make it to the party every day. This is Paul Stanley. Face the Music, A Life Exposed was directed by Fred Sanders and recorded at the media staff in Los Angeles. The engineer was John Kuvarik. It was produced by Karen Jakonski. Post-production by Common Mode, Paul Fowley, Technical Director. Text copyright 2014 by Paul Stanley. Production copyright 2014 by HarperCollins Publishers. All rights reserved. Thank you for listening.